Okay, we're live. Okay, good evening, residents, board of trustees, and all department heads. Uh, I hope you guys had a wonderful weekend, and I hope you all were out enjoying the wonderful weather today because it's fun to get cold. Um, but I would like to call to order the special board meeting of the board of trustees on Monday, September 20th at 6.41 p.m., um, can you call the roll, Clerk Key? Sure. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Trustee Steve. Present. Trustee Norwood. Present. Trustee Belcher. Here. Trustee Holmes. Present. Trustee Brown. Present. And Trustee House. Trustee House. I did see his name earlier. I don't see him now. Okay, um, he probably called back in, so just markable action. So we do have a, a quorum. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. And if anybody that's on here, can you please mute your mic if you're not speaking? I see a lot of people with um, mics not muted. So you can, so we don't get any of your background noise, please. Who else? We got a couple more people. Charles, can you mute your mic? Um, five, Hello? Seven, phone number, mute, mute your mic, Charles. Do what? Mute it? Oh, very good. And then a five, seven, phone number, mute your mic. And I don't know if it's somebody else. And trustee house, I don't know if you have having uh, phone difficulties, if so. Uh, please chime back in because we see you on here, but we can't hear you if you are on here. Okay, um, next, um, can we do prayer? Uh, Brittany, Trustee Norwood, would you like to lead us in prayer? Sure. Um, Father God, please, um, we ask that you look over us today. Um, Pray for us as a village, as a whole, as an entire board. Um, continue to just guide us to make the right decisions on behalf of the residents. Um, we thank you for allowing us to all make it tonight. And amen. Amen. Um, next, we have Pledge of Allegiance. If you would stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag. To the flag of the States of America. And to, to the Republic. Republic. For which is saying, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible liberty, liberty, and justice for all. Okay. Next on the agenda, we have approval of um, a resolution authorizing and approving an agreement for services related to village hall sidewalk replacement. Um, I know you guys spoke in the public works committee meeting regarding the sidewalk and everybody was on one accord with it. So if possible, can we have a uh, motion to approve? Is there a motion to approve the replacement of the sidewalks for Village Hall? May, may I be recognized? Yeah, can I get a motion and then we can go into discussion? Do anybody want a motion to approval of the sidewalk replacement? I like to make a motion. That's why I was asking, can I be recognized? Oh, go ahead. I'll make a motion to table items A, B, and the approval of the Illinois paternal order until we can get all items on the special board meeting. Huh? Oh, items. What do you mean? Um, there was items that should have been placed on the special board meeting by trustees that were not eligible to get on the uh, special board meeting. So i like to make a motion to table these items that are currently on the special board meeting so we can have a meeting where all items that are requested by the trustees be placed on the agenda. Okay, so for the record, that is untrue. 
no item was supposed to be on the special board meeting mm -hmm. any trustee. Now, one trustee did turn something in late as related to the CAL meeting. There's two separate meetings. CAL meetings where we discuss items. This meeting is for a vote because, as you know, we are behind schedule. And once the weather breaks, you can't pour concrete. So we have to do two steps with getting the concrete poured for Village Hall and for the alleys. Now, we had a committee of the whole meeting. It was vetted through that meeting. Every All three trustees voted yes and moving forward. And that's, that's the reason why it's on this agenda now. So I'm aware, of it. I'm aware, Mayor, but were the trustees informed that it was going to be a special meeting until we got the agenda? You was you was informed, yes, ma'am. When when we got the agenda? No, you was informed right after they had that cow, their meeting, their special meeting. So I guess I address uh the people that's on this meeting, public works. Uh trustee Brown, are you you want to table this again? And then trustee Steves. You both, you all agreed to go this yes. way. Yes, I want to table it. So you want to table it? Okay, and so do you, Trustee Steve? Yes, until we have a, uh, a special board meeting with, because I attempted to put something on the agenda and it did, it did not get on there because the board wasn't properly notified. So when we can, we can pass this and put the stuff that I requested to get on the agenda at the same time. Okay, so let's be clear for the record for the residents. And I'm fine with you, table. Y'all do whatever y'all choose. But my thing is this, uh, Trustee Steve, you and I spoke about this. It had nothing to do with the special board meeting to move the village forward to vote on items that's needed. It had nothing to do with this agenda here. It had to do with the cow meeting. The cow, you was behind schedule on turning your item in. Um, the deadline was Monday. Um, you turned your item in on Tuesday. By then, we already didn't structure a whole agenda that goes all the way to the letter of S. So what I don't like that the board does is you guys agree on something, we put it together, and then we get here, then you backtrack on whatever you guys agree on, and you guys agree to put it on the agenda for a vote so that we can move forward with doing this. Your item's supposed to get vetted to Cal, not special board meeting for a vote. So mm -hmm. I don't understand we, what's the problem. We recognize yeah, go ahead, Trustee Steve. We, we did not. I voted. We, we had a public works committee meeting. Mm -hmm. We did not know there was going to be a, pub, a special board meeting until we got the agenda. Second is that I don't mind passing this, but we did not know there was a deadline until I was told, no, I couldn't put on the agenda. You, we talked today. Y'all both apologized to me for doing it wrong because y'all didn't communicate to nobody that there was a, there was a, a time limit or a, a cutoff date. For, for agenda items. So I got my stuff in Tuesday, which we've never got it in this early. So all I'm saying is that moving forward, we can put all this on a special agenda and the stuff that I asked to put on there, get put on it. And moving forward, if we put something on it, at least communicate with the board, the timelines and the cutoff dates, because none of that was sent to us. We got the cutoff dates when I put something in and said, oh, you're past the deadline. I didn't know that. That's my stance on that. Okay. If someone's behind on a time frame, there's no reason to stop process for the village of Dalton. I'm gonna honor the request of the board of trustees and I'm going to table all the items that's here. But for the record, we did nothing wrong. Everyone, and this is me saying it publicly, your mayor. The deadline for items to go on any agenda is Monday by 5 p.m. 5 p.m. on Monday. If you do not have it on there um, to the clerk or to um, the village administrator, it will not go on the agenda. You guys asked me to follow rules. I need y'all to do the same. It, it can't be uh, I follow rules, but y'all don't follow the rules. So everybody knows this is me saying it to you guys. Monday is the deadline to have items uh, for consideration to go onto the agenda by 5 p.m. 5 p.m. is the deadline. So, okay. Um, there's a motion. Is there a second to table? A uh, second. Okay. Um, can you call the row? Clark Key. Her key, you you on mute. Unmute yourself. I apologize, everyone. Trustee Steve. <laughs> Trustee Norwood. Aye. Trustee Belcher. Aye. Trustee Holmes. No. Trustee Home, I'm sorry. My vote is no, because I voted to move forward. Okay, nay. Trustee Brown. Aye. And Trustee House. 
Aye. Uh, Trustee Steve, I didn't hear you. So are you present on the vote? Aye. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda is public comment. Derek, are there any comments? Not at this time. All right, moving on. We're gonna go right into the next agenda. We have a long agenda, so you guys say your comments, whatever it is you choose to do, and we will move forward. Um, I'm gonna go to general announcements. So let me let me say this for the record though. For the record, we're starting our Committee of the Whole at 6.50 p.m. Uh, with the Board of Trustees. And I guess we'll do roll call again. Can you do roll call, Clerk Key? Yes. Trustee Steve? Present. Trustee Norwood? Aye. Trustee Belcher? Here. Trustee Holmes? Here. Trustee Brown? Present. And Trustee House? Present. All right, um, everyone's accounted for. Next, we yes. have any trustee or department here, y'all have any general announcements? Yes. Okay, trustee Norwood. Um, I would just like to um, invite all the residents out to a trustee movie in the park with the trustees. Um, it'll be on 9.30, uh, Thursday night, um, September 30th, 2021, and it'll be inside of Dalton Park. So all is welcome, our Dalton residents. We're going to have refreshments, and we want you all to bring the entire family out to come and um, have a great community time. All right, thank you. Any other trustees? May yeah. I have an announcement? This is sure. Trustee Brown. Trustee Brown? Yes. I would like to announce to the residents that Cook County um, has a COVID-19 recovery utility assistance program and it is to assist residents with gas and electric relief, furnish repair or replacement. They did have water assistance, but it's for the city of Chicago residents only. And that information is available via website, cookcountyil.gov. Uh, so if anybody's interested in that relief, go to cookcountyil.gov for that information. Thank you, Mayor. All right, thank you. Any other, anyone else? Yes. You know, Mayor. Oh. Okay. Go ahead, Trustee. Right. Trustee, Trustee Norwood. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, Trustee. Um, real quick, uh, two quick things. Uh, one, in regards to um, my youth committee, I just want to thank uh, all the trustees. Uh, thank you, May. I invited you all to come out. Um, I'm currently partnered with Dalton Park, a basketball team, and we went out to the Sky Game yesterday. So I want to thank all the investors uh, that made it possible. I'd like to thank the trustees for the uh, team effort. I appreciate it. The ladies had a great time and so did I. And then I also would like to let all Dalton residents know um, that if you all have anyone in, in the home between the ages of three and 17 years old, um, Coach Russell at Dalton Park, um, he is looking for three to 17 year olds who are uh, interested in Panda Sports and Agility Academy. So anyone interested in making sure we spend the rest of the time outdoors um, and just get a little outside time and staying active, feel free to contact uh, Coach Russell. His phone number is 773-717-4716, and it's only $25 for the two days. So uh, feel free to contact us regarding the sports. Thanks, Mayor. Right. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, uh, this is Trustee Steve. be recognized? Yes, go ahead, Trustee Steve. Um, I would like to uh, uh, thank everyone for coming out to the first tea with the trustees. It was well attended. We had attorney Mario Reed out and he gave a, a lot of good information about the taxes in the Southland. Uh, we will have the next uh, tea with the trustees is gonna be the second Saturday of each month. The next one we're gonna be dealing with health and wellness. So please come out, look, look for the announcement, look for the email, your email. And uh, thanks to everybody, the trustees, we all came together and put that, pulled, pulled it off and it was well attended. And the, the, the residents really enjoyed it and they walked away with some valuable information. So thanks to everyone that came out and look forward to the next one. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, uh, may I be recognized? Trustee Belcher. 
Uh, the Shriners Outreach Mecca Temple Number no. Two and Daughters of Sphinx Carter Court um, has been doing well. Started our first Dalton Senior Food Distribution. Um, it's in partnership with the Neighborhood Housing Services. It'll be every other Friday um, from two to four at one forty one forty one Martin Luther King Drive in the back entrance. That's for Dalton Seniors. It started on Friday and it'll be every other Friday. So the next one is October first for uh, Dalton Seniors from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. at 14141 Martin Luther King Drive. If anybody has any questions, uh, Dolores Paschel can be reached at 773-551-9057. Thank you so much. Okay, anyone else? All right, um, that concludes general announcements. Uh, next, um, letter A, starting with discussion. Every item that's gonna be read today is all for a discussion. Uh, discussion and possible action regarding resolution 21-, uh, related to the fire department reporting software from ESO Solution Corporation to replace the current FH fire reporting software to integrate the Village of Dalton Fire Department Emergency Response Reporting with Daily's Buds General um, Central Dispatching and Billing Services. Uh, Chief Pete McCain. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening to you, Madam Clerk, Board of Trustees, Department Heads, and residents of Dalton. Um, as the Mayor just stated on the agenda tonight is for your board's uh, approval to review and uh, in regards to the ESO Solutions, which is an updated fire service software. Uh, basically every fire call that we that we uh, respond to needs to be input into a software system for grants and things of that nature. With the billing system and um, with our dispatch center, we're seeking to upgrade the system, which uh, bought out our current uh, firehouse software, which is gonna be antiquated shortly. And we need to, uh, take steps to move forward so we don't become redundant and we get ahead into the 21st century as far as report writing. Uh, the, the ESO solutions report uh, modules will include us to uh, be able to put our property maintenance in there for fire inspections, uh, our fire incidents, which we currently do, uh, hydrant testing and, and be able to have really good uh, um, information that we could pull up instead of digging through old paperwork uh, CAD integration with our computer data dispatch center and uh, online training and scheduling. So it, it'll be able to be a one-stop shop at our fingertips to be able to have the, the proper information and reduce the redundancy and be able to have the systems speak to each other between the billing company, the dispatch center, as well as our report writing. Any questions on this so far? Anybody got if not, I'm sorry, Mayor. Does anyone have any discussion? No? Okay, so Bessie, I just need a consent um, from the board as it relates to moving forward. So let's start with Trustee Norwood. Aye. Okay, Trustee Brown. Aye. Okay. Trustee Belcher. Aye. Trustee Holmes. Aye. Trustee House. I agree. Trustee Steves. I agree. Okay. So you, there you have it, uh, Chief McCain, you have six, six eyes. So it will be on the next agenda for a vote. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Board. Appreciate it. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you, Chief. Thank uh, you. Next, we have B, discussion and possible action regarding Resolution 21- related to a contract for media consulting with Black Excellent Media, LLC. So um, as you guys know, we had Sean Howard for our PR. Currently, he's no longer with us, and we are looking in another direction as it relates to bringing someone different on. I have Charles Thomas on here now. He's going to explain his company, and if y'all have any questions, by all means, please ask. Uh, Charles, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, trustees. My name is Charles Thomas, representing Black Excellence Media. Now, we are very excited about your board considering our company to represent uh, the village of Dalton in public relations and media. Now, Black Excellence was founded this year by my partner in this venture. Uh, her name is Patricia Easley. Uh, we are both on-air experienced um, broadcasters in 
at the Chicago area. I spent 45 years as a professional journalist uh, working the last 30 years as a reporter and political editor at ABC7 in Chicago. Now we will provide ready and able uh, spokespersons of, for the village on call whenever needed. Uh, but most important, we will work uh, to develop a fresh narrative about the village of Dalton and all of the good things that are happening there. Uh, we will work closely with the mayor and trustees. You will be our clients. We will work at your direction. We are not politicians. We are media professionals who will tell the story of what's happening in Dalton, not only to the people in Dalton, but also to the rest of the metropolitan area. I'm going to keep it brief. If there are any questions you have for me, please ask them. Okay, Board of Trustees, do y'all have any uh, questions for Charles? Mayor, if I could be recognized. Sure, go ahead, Trustee. Yeah. All right, um, this I All think- right, my, yeah, good um, evening. Um, can everyone mute their phones or iPads until you're speaking? Thank you so much. Go ahead, Trustee House. Okay. On this, I'm not. Um, I, I'm not in agreement with moving forward this one at this time, um, and more more related to cash flow. I think in our public works meeting, there were some kind of, some concerns raised about the cash flow being able to pay for uh, onboarding the three new customer service reps in there, as well as concerns mentioned around the bond the bond and information that I have not been able to get, or I'm just or I'm getting kind of piecemealed just has me concerned about cash flow. So at this time, I'm not in favor of moving forward. I think there was an effort with our pre previous consultant. Maybe things did not work out, but I think from a cash perspective, I want to reassess uh, before moving forward with this consultant. Okay, anyone else? Um, I, I feel the same way. Um, I do know that Chris stated at um, the public works meeting that we have to sort out some things and we're waiting for some income. So. Um, I like to wait before prior to moving forward. Talk to Chris more. Okay. Anyone else? I would as well. Only reason why is because of the three part timers that we are unable to hire in public works. And the uh, Stacy uh, did remind us there is a great need uh, for these three people to be hired in public works. Okay. Is there any other trustee or? Okay, um, for the record for myself, um, I think we need PR, as you guys saw <laughs> over the last several months being in office, uh, we need a spokesperson for the village. Um, that was already uh, budgeted in the previous budget. So all I'm doing is replacing what it's missing now. So it's no new money. So that's why I was hoping the board of trustees will be in favor of this because this is needed when something happens, you need someone to call on. Um, and as it relates to everyone saying that we can't hire public work people, that's true. That also was budgeted and put in the budget. So I don't understand where you guys are getting your information from saying that we can't hire public works uh, part-timers. Uh, that is listed on the village website and we are in the process of hiring people to work in PW. So. Mayor, can I be recognized? Sure, go ahead, trust. We were told that in the meeting by Administrator Brown. So we were told oh, that in the public works meeting that we cannot, we will not be able to hire those three uh, candidates for those positions. Okay, so trustee, uh, which there she is, uh, Village Administrator Brown, go ahead. I didn't say you would not be able to hire in those positions. I just said that we have to, uh, look at uh, what Chris had indicated earlier about cash flow, and we and the mayor and I are looking at the hire list in general. And so the thing is that the mayor and I, I said the mayor and I are sitting down looking at the hire list. So I didn't say you were not able to. We have not even finalized looking at the hire list. I said that that's what I said. Maybe it was a misunderstanding. It wasn't that you would not be able to hire. I said I put together a to be hired list for the mayor. And we were sitting down working with that. And we'll take everything into consideration as it relates to uh, some of the comments Chris had made to us concerning the cash flow. So that doesn't say that we won't be able to. 
Samir and I are working with the hireless. And okay. so obviously if the trustees feel that, that those positions should be brought up as a high priority, then uh, we've heard your concern and we will uh, take the, that into consideration as we look at the hard list. Thank you. Huh? All right, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, may I be recognized, Mayor? Yeah, go ahead, Trustee Holmes. The, the pay, would it, would, it, would it be the same or would it be less? Yes, it's the exact same amount um, he was getting, Sean Howard. It's the same amount of time, same contract, same numbers. Nothing has changed. All I'm doing is replacing the person. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I do know Brother Thomas. I do know his work, um, working in the field. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in support with as long as I'm in support with it as long as we're not increasing anything and it's just the same. We're just replacing. I'd rather move forward with it. All right. Thank you, Trustee. Anyone else? Okay, so I heard from two, three people or four. So Trustee Norwood House and Brown said no for moving forward. Home said yes for moving forward. Uh, Trustee Belcher and Trustee Steves. Mayor, you want me to just do the, the roll on that? Oh yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay, so Trustee Steve? No. Trustee Norwood? No. Not Trustee time. Belcher? No. Trustee Holmes? Yes. Yes. Sir. Trustee Brown? No. And Trustee House? No. The item failed. Okay, so that was 5-1, five, five right? Yes. Okay. All right, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Um, I will be contacting you shortly. So thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> next on the agenda, we have this discussion and possible action regarding resolution 21 uh, related to a contract to hire Kendall Parrott as a grant writer. Uh, as you know, we need a grant writer for the village. A lot of grants do come up, and a lot of times we're not prepared to um, go after them. Half the times they are filling the blanks, but there are more grants out there to be gotten. So, Kendall Parrott, where are you? You have the floor. I'm here. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, uh, Village Board. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Kendall Parrott, and um, I was approached to uh, be considered as the grant administrator for the Village of Dalton. I have over 35 years experience in grant writing uh, in the areas of parks and recreation municipal, and also not-for-profit uh, foundations. I feel that I can be an asset to the village of Dalton uh, in providing uh, additional funding and funding opportunities and funding mechanisms uh, to aggressively go after grants, uh, as well as working with the administration to ensure that you are GATA compliant and SAMS gov compliant for these grants as well as working with the legislators from the state county and also federal government uh, to secure uh, direct appropriated funding if that so presents itself um, any questions that you have to ask of me i'm more than welcome to answer any questions of the board and the mayor at this time all right, thank you. Board of Trustees, you have any um, questions for Kendall? Mayor, Mayor I have one. Uh, trustee, who was that? House? Right. Mayor, trustee House? All right, um, I'm, I'm in favor of this. I think a grant writer is a good thing. There were two things when I looked at the contract that um, I, I wanted to, I guess, for discussion. Uh, one was on, in the contract that mentioned uh 26 equal payments which i guess is like every two weeks but when the contractors come they normally come up monthly on the warrant list for review of the invoice so at one point i was hoping we can um i guess clear up to make sure that we're, we have things consistently that come on the warrant list the second thing was and there in the in the proposal i also noted that there would be conversations with legislators and things like that obviously i know there's no guarantee of grants and it takes an amount of time to get those grants in there 
Uh, but I would hope between now and the next meeting, if this moves forward, that there will be some discussion about how many applications would be submitted. So that way we have um, a little bit more tang tangible evidence that, you know, we've sought after um, one grand a month to a month or something like that. So that way we can show the value of the uh, contract. So those are my questions or comments. Okay. Uh, trustee, um, I mean, excuse me, Mayor, can I yeah, uh, really, address really. those? Sure. Uh, the first one, um, we can work on a, a monthly billing and a monthly monthly payment. I have no problem with that. And the second one, thank you. Grant grants are there's like an ebb and flow. Some all depending on what's going on with the legislature and the federal government is the timing of grants that are available for municipalities. So there may be a, a bombardment of, of grants because they will stagger the due times. And then there's a time where there's not a lot of activity going on with the COVID. There has been uh, an increased amount of monies and grants that are available out there. So it's, it's an ebb and flow throughout your fiscal year. Um, I have a very good rapport with our state legislators that represent the village of Dalton. So I'm always in tune to what's out there as well as my uh, CDBG connections with the county um, as well as the federal government as well. So it's just a matter of timing and what's available at that particular time. Okay, and I thank you for that information. Uh, I guess my question would be, uh, maybe maybe saying we're doing it on a monthly basis may not be it, but I'm thinking that some kind of measurement that a certain number of applications would be com completed uh, quarterly or every six months, uh, some kind of uh, measurement, I would say. I guess that's the what we're trying to do is make sure that, of course, this is taxpayer dollars. We want to make sure that they're, that we are being responsible and getting and showing something because I, I totally understand it. It'll, you'll put a lot of time into it and it may not always come to fruition, but we want to make sure we have just some kind of something documented showing the efforts. That's not a problem. I'm very transparent with that. Thank you very much. All right. Any other trustee? Okay. Um, Clerk Key, can you, can you call the room? The consent May May for it. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, okay. Trustee, Trustee, Trustee Norwood, go ahead. Real quick question for you, Mayor. Um, and, and, and just in regards to, to because I'm in agreement, I guess my question is just similar to um, what uh, Trustee House was saying. I guess I, I understand that they come up every now and then, but as long as it, it comes across the board in terms of like his report in regards to um, what he's doing. And, and I'm wondering, let's just say, um, for myself, can I also ask him, you know, can he work on youth grants and um, for our committee also? Yes. Okay. Okay, perfect. All right. Thanks, ma'am. All right. So May I have a question? This is okay. Trustee Brown. Oh, yeah, Trustee Brown. Okay, for Mr. Kendall, have you ever written any municipal grants? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, matter of fact, the second grant I wrote was back in the 1980s under the Johnson administration, uh, we did uh, $350,000 of lighting upgrades in alleyways in, in the city of Harvey during that time. So I'm very familiar with municipal grant writing. And just to share something with, with the board so that you'll understand, a grant is merely, some, uh, merely a story that you're telling to someone that has funds that you're trying to go after. So the stronger your story is, the greater the opportunities for getting funding. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Okay, uh, Village Administrator Brown. Yes, I just wanted to add to uh, what Mr. Kendall was saying to let the trustees know that not only do we want Mr. Uh, Parrott to um, uh, apply for grants, but he's also, we also want him to manage our grants. In other words, be the grant administrator. So once he, we, he gets, we get grants, someone has to make sure that we stay in compliance. Someone has to make sure that we are 
sending in the reports in a timely fashion. So all of those things are going to be things that will help to uh, that that we will be asking Mr. Parrott uh, to do as well. So those will be very time-consuming tasks because we have to make sure that we are in compliance uh, with um, with the grant. So I just want to make sure that they knew knew they would they know that he's not just preparing applications, but he's also administrating our grants. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, Kirky, can you call the roll? Okay, Trustee Steve. Trustee Steve. Yeah, I agree. Moving forward. Let's move forward. Okay. Norwood, Trustee Norwood. I agree. Trustee Belcher. Aye. Trustee Holmes. I'll meet your phone. Okay. okay, thank you. Trustee Brown. I for Trustee Brown. And Trustee House. I agree. Okay. All right. Six Thank you. Um, Next on the agenda, we got discussion and possible action regarding resolution 21 dash related to a contract to hire Algile Technology LLC to perform weekly COVID 19 testing on unvaccinated Village of Dog employees unless an employee. An, unless an employee um, has a religious or medical exception. Um, basically, this is on the agenda because I'm trying to make sure that the village is in compliance with the rules going nationwide. The president and the governor has announced that everyone must do weekly testing if you have not been vaccinated. I know a lot of people are already um, doing this, and I want to make sure that we are on one accord as relates to our employees. Some of our employees are vaccinated and some of them are not. But I would like them to do the weekly testing so that people not walking around being asymptomatic and can't get um, or have COVID and not even know it. So that's the it's like a protection device for us and the residents. And then we walk around and talk to every employee. So I don't want anyone to become ill. So um, Algile Technology is here to do a presentation so they can, can come and test the employees. The test they do have is two different types. I'm going to let him explain it. I'm going to just say this. Then I'm going to give you the floor ride. Um, one is the finger prick, which is really awesome. Um, I've done it several times. It's uh, blood. It's like a pregnancy test. I had to use this. <laughs> um, formation, but that's the best way I can describe it. Um, they pro they poke your finger, squeeze out a little blood, put it on a little device, and then one line, two lines. I don't know all that. I'm let him tell you. One means you you got it. Two means you don't. Something like that. And then um, it also tells you if you ever had COVID. And then he also has the nasal one as well. So um, Rod, if you will, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Let's okay. see if I can get. Uh, if I can have permission on the video, or maybe you all don't sure. want to see me. Sure. Um, yeah, share your screen, Derek. Uh, the screen sharing is still disabled. Um, Derek, are you there? Yeah, you should be able to now. Okay. Okay, and if you all can see my screen, please let me know. Yes, yes. Okay, great. So let me get up to the... Well, thank you, Mayor and, uh, and, and Village Trustees for giving us the opportunity to, to uh, present information to you all about COVID testing. Some of you all are very, very aware um, of the state of things nowadays. And um, just to truncate things and go directly to the facts, um, Agile Technologies is a company that is a, um, is a licensed and certified uh, medical services company with a national uh, NPI number or national provider identification number. We are also CLIA certified. That is a certified lab designation. Uh, for the state of Illinois, we have a national medical director who's an MD, uh, who, who is certified in all states for, um, for providing advisement and, uh, and medical advice and, uh, and signing off on testing and such. The backbone 
of what we provide folks, and I'm just gonna go directly to it, is an antigen test or, or active viral test and an antibody test. Both are extremely important because most of you all are probably aware of the PCR test or what's called the nasal pharyngeal test that's offered at Walgreens, CVS, or many of the parking lots. Uh, it's very inaccurate because that test is typically only good for a seven day period. The terrible thing about that nasal swab PCR test is that a person can have COVID and after they no longer have the active virus uh, that makes them infectious and contagious, they will have the disease. But if they take the PCR test, that person will be told that they do not have it. Because of the shedding of the virus, they will continue to infect people. And let me just get, give you all some statistics. With the Delta variant, it, it, it carries a viral load up to a thousand times more in the mouth and the nose, and it produces up to a thousand times more of the virus in the body. And just like the mayor said, now people can be exposed for less amount of time and become much sicker because of the amount of viral load. So the reason that we give two tests, these particularly uh, highly accurate FDA approved tests is that we cross validate the results and we eliminate false positives and false negatives. So we can tell if someone is currently infected and, in, and contagious. And also if an individual has been vaccinated, they should have a certain finding with the test. The value that we can also give many people is that because a lot of people were, were exposed to the, the disease when they were vaccinated, their bodies did not mount the proper immune response. So many people who were vaccinated may not have antibodies and were able to tell them that. Um, so there's some protocols that we can help put in place because the vaccination rate for the state of Illinois is approximately 52 percent. Um, for the Dalton area, I believe is in a 30, approximately 37 percent. So there's a lot of work to be done. And that means that because um, children under the age of 12 cannot be vaccinated, um, that there's still a very, very high degree of exposure and risk. And we can help mitigate that. Again, we can do weekly testing that is scheduled. Uh, the Department of Labor mandated that all employers, uh, municipal governments and such, uh, that uh, people must be vaccinated. That's number one. And number two, they, mu uh, they must be tested weekly. So we can help satisfy both of those things. We provide the documentation. We will provide a dashboard. We will report up to the Illinois Department of Public Health. Um, and the CDC as well. And we will provide the, uh, the, the uh, Board of Trustees and the mayor uh, with uh, a dashboard that will be real time. That means that as we test, you all will see the results. As the mayor said, here's a, uh, a picture of the uh, antibody test. Yeah. The reason that these, both of these tests are really good folks, when you take the nasal swab test, you have no idea of knowing whether that swab is a good diagnostic tool itself, if it has been compromised. There have been many, many cases where thousands of the swabs have been deemed to be damaged, have not had the right amount of reagent, did not have the right preservative. That is something uh, that we eliminate with both of these tests that get, that get the results in 10 minutes, not seven days, not five days, not three days, not 10 days, not two weeks, not two days. We give the results on both of these tests in 10 minutes. That means as soon as someone gets a positive result that we can advise them immediately with the action that should be taken, number one, for that individual, for their family, uh, and number two, uh, and very importantly for, for municipal government, for you know, law enforcement, for first responders, for whomever the, the village deems should be tested, um, we can then do immediate contact tracing and those people that they've been in contact with can be tested as well.
Again, the test is uh, very easily interpreted and it indicates IgM antibodies, which are the first antibodies to develop. They dissipate and then IgG antibodies are present. Now on the antigen test, again, that's results in 10 minutes, that's called an anterior nasal swab. So it only goes about one inch into the nostril instead of that very painful swab that goes up into the sinus cavity. So I'm gonna stop and if anyone has any questions, I'll, I'll take those now. I got a question. Yes. Go ahead. Trusty, trusty Steve. Sure, and, and if, if someone could turn on my camera, uh, allow my camera to, to be turned on, that would be great. Um, there Thank, you. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Que question I have for you is that I've, I've know, I know a few, a numerous amount of people who have got vaccinated and they still catch it. But I know you're saying that people who or unvaccinated are going to get tested. Are you are you testing everybody or is just unvaccinated? Because I know people who got vaccinated and they still catch it and then pass it on. So here, it, it, very very good point. And here's the reason that everyone should be tested. Uh, the analogy that I'm going to give you is that being vaccinated is like wearing a raincoat and a rain hat and boots uh, during a rainstorm. But the, but the Delta variant, because it carries up to a thousand times more of the viral load that's like walking through a flood with rain gear. So as you just said, the, the purpose of the vaccine is to stop people from getting severely ill and dying. People who are unvaccinated as most Dalton residents and probably municipal employees are, are 25 times more likely to be uh, severely ill and hospitalized and 25 times more likely to die. If someone is immunocompromised, which means they, um, they have uh, autoimmune disorders, organ transplants, um, certain pre-existing conditions. They can be up to 450 times more likely to be severely ill. Now, this is very key that you all get this because Agile Technologies does something that others simply don't do. We test people before they are vaccinated to make sure they are not exposed to the disease. Even, even vaccinated people can carry the disease and not be infected. I wanna be clear about this. So if a person is a carrier, we can identify them and have them isolated from the pop population. If a vaccinated person does, was vaccinated maybe five or six or seven months ago, they need to be tested on a regular basis as well to know how long their protections, the antibody oh. protections last. Uh, I'm going to be very careful about when I say this, but when the CDC announced or the FDA that that the third dose that they're calling a booster, and let's be clear, the booster shot is nothing but a third dose of the same vaccine. The Moderna vaccine is much more effective than Pfizer at this point. And they're not even talking about Johnson & Johnson because it's a single shot vaccine that was intended for undeveloped countries because there was a low likelihood that people would get the second shot. They simply don't have the logistics uh, or, the, or the funds. So now we're concentrating in the US on Moderna and Pfizer. And at this point, the Moderna vaccine is more efficacious or, or, um, or more effective. However, the, uh, the, the effectiveness of the vaccines is not in the 90% as they previously stated, it's approximately 75% of what they stated. All of that means this. Number one, the most important tool that you have to, to ensure the safety of municipal operations is testing. Just because someone's vaccinated does not mean they're out of the woods. And now that number one, kids are back in school, number two, uh, high school and, and college and school sports programs are gonna kick back up. There's gonna, and people are gonna go back inside now because of the weather. To give you some perspective, folks, when the shutdown happened, things were bad. Guess what? They are four times worse right now, right now as we speak. So a, a very, well, number one, we're gonna, we're gonna, we can do testing on site anywhere. 
we can staff as, as many locations as we need to as well. In addition to that, we're gonna make every effort. Can you mute your phone, whoever that is? You're not speaking, can you please mute your phone? I think it's a Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith or whoever that is. Smith, I see you muted. Yep. So um, number one, we're going to we're going to staff as many locations as we need to. Number two, we're going to do hiring and job creation from within the city of Dalton. Um, back last year, just to give a little perspective, um, there was a strike for phlebotomists to get paid fifteen dollars an hour. We're going to pay no less than twenty dollars per hour. For, a lobot for, for phlebotomist and medical assistance. Now for administrative help, that, that minimum is gonna be $18 an hour. So we're gonna pay a living wage to everyone. Number three, we're gonna do as much procurement as we can of supplies and, and such from within the village of Dalton as well. Um, so there's gonna be some economic development, there's gonna be some job creation, but most of all folks, you will have um, a very expert, expertly run testing operation um, that will be on demand, not only scheduled, but where it needs to be to, to eliminate hotspots. And then we can work with your staff to try to develop a, a communications uh, program and for advocacy of vaccinations to try to get that percentage up, but keep everyone safe as we, as we go along. And um, and just to piggyback on the, pro on the pr pr previous discussion, uh, there is a $50,000 grant that Dalton can apply for with multiple entities as the municipal office, uh, fire department, police department, uh, schools, libraries, community-based organizations, churches. So there could be 10 entities you know, within Dalton to get $50,000 to come up with a half a million, you know, for, to pay for testing. I know that there are COVID funds and ARP funds and, and other things. And then to address the cost, I'm gonna share my screen again. And we did a comparative analysis on cost. And here's what we came up with. This is what, Others are charging folks. So I don't know why this is red on here, but if you take a look at Innovative Express Care, CVS Pharmacy, SMS, um, to get same day results, those tests are gonna cost anywhere from $375 down to $200. For one test, uh, the cost will be $75. For if the person gets two tests, which will probably be likely, then the cost will be reduced to $67.50. And that will be put together uh, as a discount for getting both tests. So it's going to be the best in class uh, testing. It's going to be the fastest result at 10 minutes. It's going to be administered by licensed and certified medical professionals. And then uh, in addition to that, folks, we do have a, a larger protocol that can be put in, a safety protocol that can be put in place for the village of Dalton as well. So testing, vaccinations, and then there are some other things that we can do with building safety and air purification uh, in the HVAC systems at the village hall and other buildings as well. Uh, we're going to be doing a church on 138th and Halsted. That's about 100,000 square feet. And you all will be surprised at what we can do as far as the cost, which is much more affordable. And then we're going to be able to, to offer robotic uh, surface disinfecting of hard and soft surfaces to bring down cost as well. And that's something that in between classes, in between sessions, in between shifts, uh, that areas can be uh, disinfected. So um, along with uh, being able to provide uh, PPE, and I'm not sure where the village is with, uh, with its readiness with N95 masks. And then we also have bipolar ionization necklaces, um, which can be worn that provide an additional layer 
of protection. Um, we did provide uh, electronic brochure. Uh, I will make sure that all of the trustees get a copy of the brochure with all of the information that I'm talking about. So let me pause for any questions again. Okay, this is Trustee Brown. Now would this test be administered daily or weekly? Uh, it could, now the schedule, you could have scheduled testing weekly, but something tells me that once you all start testing and you find out some unfortunate, unfortunately, we can assume that everyone is gonna be exposed multiple times. That's how aggressive the Delta variant is. So although we might say weekly testing, there will be a need for daily testing uh, to be deployed in different places if need be, and we can satisfy that with our current staff. Okay, another question. Now, if it's weekly, will it be the ones that's vaccinated already or no? It, that doesn't matter. It should be vaccinated and unvaccinated people. Because remember, even vaccinated people can be carriers of the virus. People who are vaccinated are eight times less likely to become infected with COVID, even though they can still carry it. If they are a carrier, they are uh, 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 they pose a risk and a danger to unvaccinated people. So at this point, people, folks, it's not a question of whether you're vaccinated or not. It's just whether you're aware of your exposure and what you can do about it. And let me be extremely clear about this. Between 12 to 15% of people who get COVID, whether they are symptomatic or not, 40 to 45% of the people who catch COVID are asymptomatic and children are even more asymptomatic. So in other words, if the only thing that someone is doing is a temperature check going into a building, you are gonna miss about half of the people who have the disease. That's number one. So um, 12 to 15% of the people who get the disease have long haul illnesses. And those include atrial fibrillation, glaucoma, paralysis, stroke, cardiovascular uh, um, damage, respiratory uh, system damage, blood clotting, and many other things. Unfortunately, the list of long haul diseases is actually growing as we go along. And this is the reality of folks is we're not just dealing with the Delta variant. We are also dealing with Lambda, Kappa, and Mu. The Mu variant has been found to be very evasive with vaccines. The longer a variant is allowed to spread within a community, it will produce additional variants. So one of the goals is going to increase, is going to, going to be to increase the vaccination level of the village of Dalton and surrounding communities as well. So we want to- I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say, so on a scheduled basis, we will offer vaccinations <clears throat> along with the testing, which is the safest thing to do, because then a person can be tested. They can know that they don't have the virus. They can get vaccinated. And then a person has to be tested two weeks after they get the vaccine so that they so that we can mm -hmm. demonstrate to them if they have produced antibodies. Okay, one last question. I don't know if you will be able to answer it. Yes. So would that cost be to the village or would it be the cost go to each individual's insurance? So one of the things that when we did the proposal, it, it was um, stated that we should, that it should be bill, billable to the village, uh, possibly with some of the COVID funds or, or, uh, or ARP funds. Now, what we could do is we could bill against the insurance and those insurance uh, reimbursements could go back to the village. So that could uh, make some of them a zero sum expenditure and, and, uh, and extend the dollars that the village has available through the federal government or the state government for, for COVID. Yeah, but okay. just for the record, um, we're Thank trying you. to use the funds from the COVID uh, money that we just received is how we will pay for this. That's the point. Anybody got any more questions? Uh, hey. I'd like to say one. Thing. Sure. 
Yeah, Mr. Mr. Martin, I would like to, yes. like, you know, I thank you for your thorough presentation. And I like the fact, because I think what I've noticed that a lot of people who do have the vaccine, they have a, they have a blanket sense of confidence. I got the vaccine, I'm good. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that you, you actually said it's the unvaccinated and the vaccinated, because I can see they're trying to make a war between the unvaccinated versus the vaccinated, but everybody has to be super cautious with their, with their life and with this, with this, especially with the variants coming out. But some people have religious exemptions and they have religious reasons why they're not taking the vaccine. And you have well, to respect that. You so know what? I, I really appreciate your, your thorough breaking down of that. You know something, and, and, and thank you so much for that input. We also respect those things, but we also do the best that we can, uh, whether we're whether it's on site or we have uh, two, two locations at Fort City Mall and River Oaks Mall. We also have uh, a location with the city of Gary and with in New Mexico, uh, Arizona, where we've done testing across the, across the country. And we've also actually we've done international testing engagements as well for conferences, for um, for seminars um, and for large business and travel groups as well. Um, we've done work in, let's see, New York, New Jersey, North Carolina, um, Illinois, New Mexico, New Jersey, um, Colorado, a, a number of states. Um, but we're concentrating our effort back here now because the vaccination rate is so low. And unfortunately, folks, and I'm, let's just be very, you know, really honest about this. The vaccination rate in the Dalton area is probably in the neighborhood of about 37%. That's less than half of what it needs to be. We have our work cut out for us, but we will be a constant um, presence that is part of the community. Uh, and that makes uh, our science-based approach and the way that we communicate the facts and information just as I did this evening to help people understand the risks ahead of them and to help break down the barriers uh, of belief uh, that many people have with getting the vaccine. And also while people have that resistance to the vaccine, uh, people will get tested. And that is the most important thing at this point to make sure we can identify those people, get them isolated. And if they've been in the work environment, school environment, um, law enforcement or, or wherever that we can get the other people that have been around them tested immediately. And that is the power of having two tests that give results, highly accurate results in 10 minutes. Uh, this is Trustee Belcher. I have yeah. a question, just a yeah, quick please. question. So was this um, posted somewhere to go out for bid or, I mean, was this the only agency that we uh, utilize for, for this man? Well, Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's several companies I've used um, here at the Village of Dalton. He was the only company that provides the testing that do the finger prick, and you will know right in and there if you have it or don't. Everyone else is a wait on getting the results back. And a lot of people are going his route because he offers both testings and he knows it in 10 minutes. So their facility is not getting shut down. Um, some couple people, I ain't going to put them on blast, got shut down and been shut down for two days. But when he came along and he tested them, they was able to operate right then and there. So my goal is to make sure that the village continues to operate and not shut down um, in time. Because I've used several different ones over all the events I've had. I've used uh, two different ones at both my events, which was the workout one I had over the weekend. Um, they came out. That was a success. And then also I used the one that South Suburban uses as well. So I used basically three different companies. But he was the one that I would love to use for uh, our residents and also our employees. And okay, if I thank might, you. If I might add, uh, Trustee Belcher. Um, in these situations with a lot of municipal services and contracts that would normally go out to bid, uh, fortunate for us um, during this time and fortunate for you all, um, the suite of services that we have combined, uh, you will not find at another company as far as the two types of tests, air purification, uh, PPE, ro uh, robotic disinfecting, and a number of other specialized things that we provide. Um, so if you, if you put it out to bid, you simply wouldn't have companies that would be, that would even be able to respond to it. Yeah. Any more questions? Mayor, if I can be recognized. Sure. Go ahead, Trustee House. Okay. Two questions. One is, um, have projections been done in terms of how much, uh, uh in terms of just guesstimates of how many tests we would do and what that would cost on a monthly basis so that we can, uh, make sure we have some planning. I know we mentioned the COVID money, but, 
Are we talking 5,000 a month, 10,000, 15? Do we have rest rough estimates of how we're gonna be, of how that's gonna be done? And separate uh, from Mr. Martin, there was another company I heard, um, Essential Healthcare or Essential Home Health, was, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, uh, but they've mentioned that they were getting funded directly from the federal or I have to have come communication with them uh, so that it would not be a cost to the employer. Uh, so I want to see if you're familiar with any other companies that offer that kind of service and if that's a possibility. Well, uh, there might be companies like that, but I'll I, I put it this way. You get what you pay for. Um, and there's a lot of PCR testing out there that's made available by the state. And it is PCR testing. Uh, it will not be rapid testing. You will have generally have to wait for results. All tests are not created equal, folks. The two tests that we that we do are best in class or authorized for what they call point of care. There are very few tests that are authorized for point of care. Uh, so just to say that our tests are 98% plus in terms of accuracy, PCR testing, like uh, most of you all have had and experienced, can be up to 48% inaccurate. That's number one. Number two, PCR testing can miss asymptomatic carriers up to 86% of the time. So if everybody remembers when they had the super spreader events at the White House and, and other places, they were doing PCR testing uh, in those places. Uh, I can provide... Uh, uh, documentation or whatever it is that we would need to, we simply have not failed uh, in our testing efforts, whether it's been hundreds of people, thousands of people, or 50 people. Uh, we have a track record that, that proceed, uh, a, a good reputation that precedes us. So there might be no cost uh, for some of that testing, but that does not speak to the quality of that testing, sir. Thank you for that. And then here's the second part was there on the projections. If any projections have been done on if we have based on the number of employees we have and uh, just the what you've experienced, how ballpark, how much will we will we, will we be looking at? Uh, what, uh, well, you all have approximately twenty three thousand residents. How many um, village, municipal, and and other employees do you all have roughly? Oh, in terms of employees, it's 138. Man, I'm asking that question. I think there, um, there would sound like that these projections have not, are still in the works. So, so I mean, that would be something. Yeah, I can respond to that. So, so basically, um, he's here for you guys to guide him on what you guys want him to do. So, mm -hmm. do you guys want him to do the vaccinated people as well as the unvaccinated, or that's that's how he can go off his price. You want him to do everybody, I mean, all the employees, or you just want him to only do the people that has not been vaccinated. So that's really at you guys' discretion. And then that's what he will do. And then uh, Mayor, Mayor Henniard, if I could even add, if I could even add a practical matter, is that is any employee who's gonna be uh, positive or tested, I can guarantee you that they are gonna want their families and you all will probably want their families tested as well. Cool. Uh, as far as uh, as far as municipal employees and such, because of, uh, to get safety, you not only have to get safety for that individual, you have to you have to know the safety of the household. If the household is safe, uh, then you can do better planning and such. Otherwise, uh, you, you're, you're kind of playing the hope methodology and that that never works out very, very well. What I can do is present you all, you know, with a plan for testing municipal employees. Um, emergency responders, essential staff, streets and sanitation, you know, some general residents. It would be up to you all, according to the, the amount of uh, uh, COET funds that you have for testing so that we could space it out. Um, but I guarantee you, if you do more testing at the beginning, it will decrease the amount of testing required in the months to come. Any more questions? Yeah, yeah, um, yes, ma'am, I have okay, so something to say. Trustee Norwood. Um, so I guess my, because in terms of, I, I personally uh, visited the facility, his um, revokes facility over the weekend um, to get, to have some tested, conducted, and 
uh, overall, I spoke with um, Mr. Smith and he seems pretty knowledgeable. Um, I guess my only concern, and I'm interested in moving forward in terms of with him in the company in general, because as I stated, I think that he seems informed. Um, and overall, I, I like the procedure, the testing was fast. Um, he was accessible and I appreciate that. I guess my only, my, my main concerns is us figuring out the detail in terms of like they stated, just the amount. Um, so I guess that we would really have to figure out if we'll do vaccinated or unvaccinated, um, how much it'll cost us a month, where we're getting the money from. So those things are the only things that that comes into question with me. I don't have a problem with moving forward in terms of the company. Like I stated, uh, we had a long talk and I'm like, OK, you know, information is good. I just want to know uh, before moving forward uh, about the how we're going to do it, the plan, the overall plan in regards to the how we'll be informed as trustees. So will there be a report um, if we do move forward on a monthly basis? Will we know how we know how many people was tested? Will we know how many people were billed? Will it come before the board before we de decide to do outside testing in regards to if we do decide to find some um, some employees positive before we move forward with testing their family members and things like that? Because I'm with that also, but will it be presented in front of the board or will we have a list? I just want to make sure that the cost is a concern and where it's being built. And sure. So for. thank you so much, Trustee Norwood. So one of the things that we made uh, sure of in the information that we sent over was that even though it might be paid out of COVID funds, that we still have the ability to bill insurance. And, when the, and so what we will do is provide a weekly report or bi-weekly report <laughs> on number one. Now, because of HIPAA compliance, we can't sh share the results with you okay. with, with the broader group. Um, however, we can state who has been tested. Um, we can indicate when insurance has been billed and when, that insur when those insurance payments come in and we will have full transparency uh, on that with you all. So we will work, my operations manager will work with whatever designated person on your side so that we will have a, a, a weekly or bi-weekly report uh, on the billing. It might be a monthly report, but as I stated, to mitigate the cost, any of those insurance payments would be then credited back uh, to the village. Uh, and as I stated earlier, um, we, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, an organization, Phalanx Family Services, for instance, on 119th and uh, Halstead in Chicago, that we helped them get $50,000 uh, for testing and such. So those are things that we can do for the village of Dalton as well, uh, because we have uh, um, experience doing that. And then just a, a little bit of the resume, like I said, I've worked with uh, global pharmaceutical companies. Uh, with scientists and researchers on the development of, of oncology drugs, prosthetics, breathing devices. I've also been a nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare trainer in the military as well. And I implemented the Affordable Health Care Act or Obamacare for the entire, entire state of Georgia by consolidating 10 state agencies for two and a half million people in 300 locations in 153 counties. So this is something... Um, what we would do for you is a much smaller scale of what we've done otherwise. Got it. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I like it. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Martin, while I have you. Yes. So I think that you pretty much answered uh, most of my concerns. And I, I like the fact that you stated that you were going to interested in hiring our, our residents because that was Absolutely. one of my questions. So Absolutely. I like Okay. So I like the fact that you said you, that you will do that. Um, and regarding, so my only concerns overall um, is just the transparency in regards to billing, which you said that, you know, hey, we'll be transparent. Uh, we'll notify the board of the reports so that we are aware, not the results, but just how many people are being billed, just so that we're all aware of the, um, the funds. Now, I guess my second main concern is I know that there's two parts that's accessible in regards to the testing. So mm -hmm. there's the no swab, which detest, detects whether you have COVID or not. And then there's the antibody testing. Correct. correct? Okay, correct. so the, what's the, the give me, can you give me the difference the, in cost for the two and then give me the combined difference? Because I heard you state that if we conduct, conduct both testing, you, there was some type of discount, so. That's correct. Explain? If, if, there, if an individual gets only one test, okay. then $75 would be billed. 
to, to the village. Okay. And then we would bill insurance. If the person gets both tests, then the cost will go down to $67.50 for both tests. So instead of it being $150 for both tests, I believe that makes it uh, what, 135 or 125 or something like that for both tests. Got you. So you have either the option to do the, the one test for $75 or the combined test for a discounted price of 135 That's correct. Got it. So um, in regards to um, our game plan, I just want to know if there's a way for us also when we're conduct figuring out a plan, is there a way for us to decide whether or not we'll conduct both testing because I guess that's an you know that's a concern also it's a it's a price difference so maybe uh we we may say hey one week we'll do both or just a test for the item antibodies and then the second week we'll do just one or what do you think is there a way that we can kind of come to a, a game plan in terms of that or what do you suggest so say for instance um there might be um, you know, before municipal meetings or training sessions or something like that, where people should get the active viral test, which is the antigen test. That one uh, uh, gives us information on whether the individual is actively infected at that point. Now, see, the good thing about having the antibody test as well, though, is each test, no test is perfect. So, and they have strengths and weaknesses. So we combine the two to shore up the weaknesses of the other. If you get both tests, sometimes the antibody test can determine that the individual has early an onset antibodies and it's just beyond the threshold of the antigen test. So again, I would give you all the information, um, give you what they can accomplish, and then maybe we can come up with a comprehensive strategy that if there are certain activities we definitely always want to give the antigen test. If people are vaccinated, they should definitely have the antibody test. Got it. So for you're saying that for the most part, you will suggest both testing uh, weekly. Before well, it's, it's most important that people get the antigen test because that tells you if it's early detection for active virus. However, if a person has not been vaccinated, and they have antibodies, then that means that they have had the disease. That individual might even need to go for emergency health care because they may, they may be experiencing sicknesses or illnesses and they were never aware that they had the disease. That's what's so incredibly important. Um, Trustee House, you were mentioning you know, another, you know, other companies that do PCR testing. If you only do PCR testing respectfully, you would not be doing enough to keep your residents and municipal employees safe because the limitations of that test cannot tell you if people have had the disease and don't even know it. And that is extremely valuable because many people will develop heart conditions, blood clotting, respiratory issues that they may think is a cold or the flu or something else. And because the viral load with Delta variant is so high, you don't want anyone to go any further than they have to without getting proper healthcare attention if they've had the disease. And that antibody test is the only thing that's gonna tell a person a month after, you know, they've had, they got, they caught the disease that they've had it. If you test anybody with a PCR nasal swab a month or two weeks after they've had the disease, it is not gonna give a positive reading. It will tell them negative. And that's, what's, that's what a false negative is. It means that a person is told they're negative, but they've actually had the disease and many of those people die. Or you have people who, who were vaccinated, but they were exposed to the disease when they were vaccinated. So their bodies never mounted the proper antibody response. So again, the most important thing is the antigen test but that antibody test becomes a, a very important tool. So I, again, I can't make that decision for you all. That's a strategy that I can help you all come up with so that you actually have a very efficacious and well thought plan because guarantee you the villages and the cities around you are gonna report a heck of a lot more problems than you all will be. 
Okay. All right. Thank you, Ron. Because what we're going to do, we're going to wrap this up because we got like 20 yeah. more things on the agenda. So if you could put something together, what the board of trustees is asking you to do, I'm going to uh, poll them now to see if they want you to move forward. Yeah. And if so, just put something together. They got two weeks to go over it. You guys go back and forth with however y'all want the structure to be. And then uh, we'll vote for it at the next board meeting of October. So um, if you could, Clerk Key, can you poll the board to see if you guys want to move forward? Unmute yourself. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Trustee Steve. Unmute okay, yourself. unmute yourself. Oh. <laughs> I'm okay. I I'm okay with moving forward. I would okay. like to find out what other in your report, Mr. Martin. Could you write up what other towns and other municipalities that you're actually in right now, so we can see that too before we make that decision to vote to see what other towns and stuff that you're in. Okay. He okay. named them in his um, speech, but okay, no problem. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, 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 it was a lot, so I might have missed it. You know what I mean? So just put that in the report. Okay, Trustee Norwood. Um, I'm interested in moving forward for now. Um, I, I'm interested in moving forward for now. I, I just want a little bit more information in regards to, to billing and where the money will come from, but for now, it's a go. Okay, Trustee Belcher. Um, I'm going to pass on this vote because I don't have enough information. I know it's two weeks, but uh, we're saying, is this a consensus to just vote to the next board meeting? Or are we saying this is something that we're interested in moving forward with? I guess that's where I need clarity on. Okay, so this is a consensus to go to the next board meetings. So basically, you guys will speak to him over the next two weeks as it relates to structure. What is you want him to do on um, putting a plan together for a vote? So if y'all want unvaccinated people, you want their families, you want people that um, are vaccinated, like you got to tell him what you want him to do. And then the money for the record, everybody keep asking is coming from the COVID fund. So it's not coming from the general fund or any other money. So we just need direction. If okay, you want to so with that said though, Mayor, at the end, of, I think um, the last item on the agenda is discussion on how we're going to spend it. So we already have preparations of how it's being spent because you're saying it's coming out the money and we haven't even talked about how the money is going to be spent. I'm okay, but this is us talking about clarity. it. Okay, so okay. this is us talking about it now. So it's up to you if you want to, you agree or disagree with how it's going to be. The money has to be spent as related to COVID. So this is a COVID issue and it helps our employees, our staff and us. That's all around them. So it's up to you if you agree or you disagree. All right, I'll pass on so my pass and go with whatever the majority was. I'm gonna pass on this, thank you. All right. Okay, Trustee Holmes. Let's move forward. Trustee Brown. I'm gonna disagree at this time right now. Trustee House. Um, on this one, I would agree to move forward. But I would I, I would suggest like that we build that we start with talking with Chris and coming up with a dollar figure and tailor the program around that dollar amount so that way we know what we're that way it'll kind of give a little bit more direction that's coming out of there. I do believe there's going to be a lot of things, a lot of details if, we're, if the thing is to try to get it for a vote in two weeks. I think there's going to be a lot of information that has to come out, be discussed, and also we want to make sure that we we get feedback from the community. So. I'm concerned in terms of the time frame being if, whether or not two weeks is enough, but I do think that moving forward helps us to get some more hard figures that we may be able to make a more educated decision. So I'm for moving forward. My suggestion start with a amount of amount budgeted and tailor the program around that amount. Okay. So you are the finance person, so you can help him with that. Um, if Rod, you can text trustee house your information so you guys can speak um i am for the i think he said a uh, 125 dollars to do both i think everybody should take both tests uh, i know i do i know that trustee norwood just did it over the weekend so if you guys just go and do a trial um with him you'll see kind of how the test is proceed and that will be it what is the votes uh clark key um four yes and two nays and vote passed to move forward. Okay. Thank you so much, Rod. Thank you okay. so much, everyone. And I'll be in touch. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next Thank you. agenda is discussion and possible action of ordinance number 
621 amending ordinance number to change the registration uh, renewal date and the related penalties for each long-term rental. Um, ex extending property registration champs LLC contract to include long-term rentals. Um, is Ms. Harris available? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right, so the Village of Dalton Housing Department, of course, along with the mayor, is seeking to amend the rental property ordinance to change the property registration and inspections to 12 months after the initial registration date for each property. In addition, the Housing Department is seeking to add an addendum to the current property registration champions LLC, current vacant property registration contract to include rental property registration. Additionally, the changing rental registrations to 12 months from the initial registration date will permit inspections to not all be due at the same time as they are now and ensure that inspections can be done in a more efficient manner. The rental property registration for the Village of Dalton Housing Department is currently due for all properties on April 30th. And the registration fee doubles if not paid by May 1st. <clears throat> Changing the rental property registration to be due 12 months after the initial registration will increase the village's cash flow since funding will be due throughout the year versus all at the same time and be much more manageable. In addition, adding an addendum to the contract of property registration champions LLC's contract to collect the registration fees will also increase the registration fee collections similar to how they increase the collections for the vacant properties for the Village of Dalton. With respect to the vacant property registration, the Village of Dalton, excuse me. <coughs> Ooh, nice. Sorry about that, thank you. The Village of Dalton collected um, $15,800 from January, 2018 to July, 2018. However, once we've contracted uh, Property Registration Champions LLC, by the Village of Dalton, we've received a steady increase of revenue. So from August of 2018 to December of 2018, we collected $92,428. In 2019, we collected payments in total of $163,568. And then in 2020, we collected payments in total of $166,864. And this is all with the contractual agreement that we have with uh, property Registration Champions, LLC. So in this case, Property Registration Champions, LLC will retain $50 for each property registered. This will be covered by the $100 per property registration fee. The recommendations is basically from the Village of Dalton Housing Department amending the rental property ordinance to change the property registration and inspections to 12 months after the initial registration date of the property. And then in addition, the housing department recommends that the village add an addendum to the current property registration champions, LLC's current vacant property registration contract to include rental property registration. So in other words, we currently have the vacant property registration with them. And so now we're looking to add an amendment to the current contract to add in rental property registrations. The Village of Dalton currently has all long-term rental assignments due on April 30th of each year, all at the same time, which I previously discussed. This means that the inspections are also due. Having all the registrations due at the same time does not have a good effect on the cash flow. In addition, it causes a real burden for our inspectors to get the inspections done. Therefore, it would be more efficient for the village if every rental property registration was due 12 months after their initial registration. It also given an opportunity to space out the inspections as well. The village also does not have a mechanism to collect unpaid registrations or even to determine properties that are rentals that are not reported. So that's based on the synopsis that we came up with for uh, changing the date as well as um, adding the rental registration with property registration champions. Okay, uh, trustees, do y'all have any discussion on this item? Uh, um, I do. Okay, and then I'm gonna call on Scott after you, uh, trustee. He's from uh, Champs. Champs okay. okay, go ahead. Okay, and maybe he may add some more, but why, why I have uh, Miss Harris on the phone? I, I guess I'm, I mean, I'm, like, I'm wondering. We're talking about two separate things, correct, Miss Harris? 
two like separate, two separate changes. changes. Well, yeah, two separate changes, but they all tie in together. And so what that means is that because we currently have um, property registration champions, LLC, doing our vacant property registrations, mm -hmm. they also provide a rental registration service. And mm -hmm. so the second end of what we were talking about is to make an addendum to add in that part to their contract. This also helps us with changing um, the second part. I'm sorry, the initial first part was in regards to changing the rental registration dates because currently we do it with the budget year, which is always May 1st to April 30th. But in this instance, we were looking to do it 12 months from their initial registration renewal time. So we have different people that actually still come and pay throughout the year. They incur the double fees. But if we input the fact of changing it 12 months from their last initial registration date, then they can pay that part on time as well as then that way they have time to pay it. So you have some people that just don't like to pay until June, July, August, whereas our cutoff date was initially April 30th. If we start with the 12 months from the date of their last registration, they can get it in on time and we can continue to collect money throughout the year instead of it just being swamped within those first four months of the year. And then we're booking inspection after inspection after inspection after inspection, whereas we do it 12 months throughout the year from the date that they initially registered, taking into account of this year. That'll give us an opportunity to kind of stretch it out in regards to our inspectors, um, the payments, so on and so forth. Got it. So let me just, um, I guess I'm just, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this this part correctly in regards to the date change. Mm -hmm. um, as of now, everything is typically due on April 30th is, is, is how it's set. By right? April 30th, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how it's normally is working is between May the 1st and April 30th, people are just kind of coming in and... Just randomly coming in, but then they face the, the wrath of having to pay double fees. So if we take into account when they registered this year, it could be 12 months from the time that they registered this year. Gotcha. So say for instance, you had some, like I had a customer today come pay for a rental. So their registration will be due on September 20th of 2021, as opposed to having them urgently paying it by April 30th of 2021. Perfect. Okay. That's what I was wondering. So uh, the main difference will be as opposed to us, because I know that it, it used to be a time where, they'd have it set up so that around April 30th, that that money that comes in, um, it all comes in at one time. But now you're saying we'll just have it coming in all throughout the year as opposed to worrying about it just at that one time period. Okay. And then I guess in regards to the registration date part, let me just make sure I have that part correct. Um, so we already have checks over our vacancy, our vacant. Okay. The only addition is in regards to the rental, they're going to, in, in regards to the rental registration, they'll just assist us with that portion. Yes. Got it. So and, how much, once, uh -huh. and so we're working on the part, I guess that's where the other guy will come in, in regards to they'll be collecting the payment, but we still have the opportunity to set up the inspection. Okay. So, but at least it'll kind of help alleviate you know, with what we already do in the housing department, because sometimes they can get a little swamped. And so when you have someone that can at least aid and assist with receiving the payments and then also sending out the reminders for the rental registration, they're going to help with that portion of it too, from my understanding. Okay. So overall, this system will make you, you the, it, it run smoother. Things run smoother yes. for you all in the housing department. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what I'm wondering. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Um, and this is for Chris. Um, with the with this changing, um, if it is say for starting twelve months in it, how would that affect the cash flow for the village? Um, just like Trustee uh, Nora was saying, with normally us having you know the cash flow that comes in in April, which is from the uh, business or whatever those fees are, then we get another cash flow that comes in roughly in um, June and beginning of July from the stickers. So how does this affect the cash flow for the village? Instead of becoming in, you know, all at one time or one month versus sporadically throughout the year. 
So these fees with it being distributed more evenly throughout the year will make a little, it will have some of an impact on cash flow just because of the fact that if we always anticipated all the cash between January and April, now it'll be spreading out throughout the year, it will have some effect, but it should, for the months where we don't have much cash flow from real estate tax and those type of things, it should help improve cash flows in those months. January and February, that will be a little bit of a difference, but February and March in normal time period pre-COVID is when we would get our real estate taxes in, so those would... We don't really need, I don't want to say we don't need, but at that point, cash flow was not a significant concern when we were in the regular property tax distribution season. Okay, so I just want to be clear on what you're saying, because like you just said, the January, February, which now the tax bill is coming in February to March or whatever. So it's delayed when it comes. So that means we're going, uh, is this, we're going an extended period of time or with the I just want to be clear on what you're saying because I understood what uh, Sharon was saying. But if it's okay, the property taxes come in, and that's normally a, a few months after the bill goes out, which is we don't we can't uh, predict the time, and we just know roughly in prop to May. So in April, when normally all of these monies comes in, it wouldn't be the same. Or are they going to use just new businesses that's coming in, starting with this uh, from 12 months? Or how is that going to work? So would it be all of the ones that's currently just going from April to April or just new businesses coming in going from month to month? I mean, month to 12 month, year, year to year. I'm sorry. I re my response. Sharon, do you want to take the part about who this will apply to, and then I'll talk on the cash flow effect of it? Oh, hold on one second. I'm sorry. You said who it will apply to. So, like I said, we, I guess it's still just for discussion, but it's mainly we're trying to just determine, and then that way we can get um, a way to track and see, like take, receive all the payments. We have an, a report to let us know when all the payments came in. And so therefore they can do it 12 months from the time that they initially paid. Now, the, the thing about it is, is that starting January 1st, we would always do it based on the fiscal year. So then they had at least up to four months to pay. Whereas they're going to change the time frame, and it'll be renewed 12 months from the time that they initially paid. So it, it, like I said, we, we don't know, but at the same time, it will kind of level out the cash flow instead of because toward the end of the year, all of the rents will start to dwindle down. But at the same time, you'll have new people who are coming to register their properties, as well as those who, who like to just do it late. They'll get a registration reminder that it's time for them to do it 12 months from the time that they initially paid. Okay, um, Clark. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, yeah, one yeah. second. Let me call on Scott so that we can okay. get some clarity to this. Uh, first, I'm call on uh, Village Administrator Brown, and then yes. we'll go yes. to Scott. Go ahead. Yes, I uh, just wanted to make sure Trustee Betcher knows that we're gonna we're gonna set up a transition method for everyone that's currently registered, and then going forward from there, the new people will be from their 12 months um, to answer her question. But, but um, Scott, want, uh, Scott is from the company and he will explain how not only will they be collecting uh, the um, money from the current individuals that, that voluntarily come in to pay, they're gonna help us search out individuals that really are renters and are not paying. That is the biggest benefit that I see with this company. So Scott Blaze, can you, uh, Blasey, can you uh, come on please? Certainly, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Great, good evening, Mayor, uh, trustees, uh, and thank you staff. I think you laid it out pretty perfectly. Uh, I don't think I can, I can do any better than that. Uh, I can reiterate uh, some of the comments, however, um, we show there are roughly around 2,000 long-term rentals uh, right now uh, in your community. 
Uh, so yes, one of the big benefits is we're going to collaborate with staff and reach out and identify and get those ones registered that have been flying under the radar for a number of years. Um, so that's a huge benefit. And another benefit is it'll be the same platform that we register foreclosed and abandoned properties on. So it'll give staff uh, the opportunity to collaborate with landlords uh, in real time in a communicative platform that typically doesn't exist otherwise. So there's a, there's a number of benefits, not only to the, to the village of Dalton, but also to the, the landlords as well. Uh, it helps them uh, be more in tune with what's going on. Uh, the comments regarding having everything due at one time and the inspections involved around that are spot on. Uh, I administered a code department for 24 years in my previous life. And my biggest nightmare was having to do hundreds of, hundreds of inspections in a small amount of time. Uh, everybody suffers, right? I mean, it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, and the inspections typically don't get done as well as you'd like them to get done. So our job, uh, just like we do with the foreclosed abandoned properties, is to be proactive and identify properties that you may not have already captured. Uh, so those revenues would increase. And I would suggest uh, kind of along the lines of what staff has been saying that it's better to spread those revenues out over a 12 month time than to count on them all happening at once. And then lo and behold, what if the revenues are half of what you thought they were at the last moment? Uh, you don't have any ability to kind of do some proactive forecasting in terms of your budget. And uh, as far as the total for what we've done uh, with your community thus far in the foreclosed and abandoned properties, uh, we've remitted over $600,000 since our partnership began in 2018. And all of that is at no cost to uh, your community. So it's strictly a fee sharing business model. Uh, we're the only ones that do that. And we're truly a community partner in the sense that we're with you every step of the way and support support the program along the way. So. We're in constant communication with staff. Uh, we'll get the existing registration staff already has. Uh, we'll set up the renewals, et cetera. And uh, obviously welcome any feedback from staff along the way and make any improvements that staff feels is necessary to make the program as good as it can be. And with that, I'll be quiet unless there's any questions. Okay, any questions? I would like, I would like to make a statement or question, but. I mean, I understand we've been, we've had pro champs here for the last few years, mm -hmm. but see explanations like this is, is, is kind of convoluted. It's kind of, people have a lot of questions. That's why I think we definitely have to establish a housing committee and a housing committee will address these specific answers and questions because we got a lot of stuff on the agenda. So we can't take up too much time on this one agenda, one item. But I understand pro champs been here for a while and that they've been here at least for, for years some time. But I think moving forward for, for anything dealing with housing like this that takes a long time to explain, we need a housing committee for commi to have a committee meeting to explain it all. Okay. And so you really didn't have a question to him. No, yes. No, I was just saying. Okay. Yeah. Any other any other questions so we can move to the next agenda? Uh yeah, yeah. I got two questions, May. I have one for Pro Champs. Sure, go ahead. Um, so in regards to the village, we're stating that this is not going to cost the village anything. That's correct. Okay. So I just want to make sure I'm clear on what my understanding. So overall, at this very moment, we're using you, you all for vacant property registration. You all also have a, another component, which is a rental registration. You all are saying, hey, we've been with you all for a while. Let us take over the rental registration portion so that we can help you all obtain more money and help us keep up with the, which, which will also help us keep up with the rentals. It's more of a partnership of efficiency. I think as uh, your housing department already laid out, it's more about providing efficiency and freeing up time for the, her department to focus on other code related matters, uh, similar to what we do with vacant property. Uh, administrating this type of registry typically is labor intensive and uh, we're very good at it because that's all we do as opposed to local government doing the thousands of things you have to do every day uh, 
to basically run your village. So it's a, uh, it's a no cost partnership. Absolutely. Uh, it's a fee sharing business model. Uh, so if we, we only get paid based on properties we register. Mm -hmm. So if we're not good at it, we don't make any money and go broke. So it's, uh, <laughs> we're in this together. Uh, we work hard for you and we only make money when you make money. And it's really as a code official forever, it's not really to me about the money. It's about the efficiency for the department and getting properties, long-term rental properties inspected uh, routinely and making sure they're safe for their tenants. Uh, that's the end game for me and really for pro champs. Uh, the money's just part and parcel to that, basically to cover the expenses of expenses the pro champs and staff puts forth in administering a program like this so it's i really don't like to look at it as a revenue producer more than a cost recovery model um, which obviously has worked out well with the other program hope i answered your question okay yeah kind of sort of i guess because i'm wondering I, I know that sharon was stating uh, there was a cost of $50 or something. And I, I guess I just want to make sure I'm clear on that $50 is not coming from the village. It's, the, it's coming from the money that you obtained from the registration, correct? Correct. The registrant. Yes, ma'am. Okay. That's, that was my big thing that I wanted okay. to know from you. Okay. And, and, and thank you so much. Um, yeah, you've answered my questions. I just have one more question for uh, Chris. Go ahead. Hey, 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 Chris. Um, I heard you say, and I, I just want to know, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm clear on this before um, moving forward. I heard Chris state that there is going to be a difference uh, over time with this, with us collecting the money, going from collecting the money all at one time to collecting the money uh, period, uh, sporadically. I guess my question is because I've heard Chris state before that uh, things were financed and it's just a, a little rocky. I guess I'm wondering, uh, Chris, Will my decision to move forward with this from your, in your opinion, Chris, from the finance standpoint, will this hurt us in the upcoming months with us being a little rocky with cash or no, um, it's a matter of, of it's just still coming in and we'll be fine. No, I don't think this will have an impact from that standpoint because your largest cash flow items to come out are going to come out in November and December because those are when you have to make your bond payments. And that's mm -hmm. one of the largest and most important cash flow concerns for any municipality. And any cash flow we can, we can get in between now and then will be additional cash flow that will actually help out the village. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Thanks, Chris. So I want to make sure. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, Clerk Key, can you do assessment of moving forward? Sure. Um, Trustee Steve? Yes, move forward. Trustee Norwood? Uh, yes, yeah, so we're moving forward. I just, um, I'm just, before, we're doing so. I just want to make sure. Um, Chris, answer my question. We're fine. I'm moving forward. Trustee Belcher? Yes. Uh, Trustee Holmes had to leave. He wasn't feeling well, so he did call me. Uh, Trustee Brown? Yes. And Trustee House? Yes. That's right. five yeah, A's. All right. Yay. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, and thank you, Scott. Thank you. You're welcome. Next on the agenda is discussion and possible action of ordinance um, 21 dash, amending ordinance to change the registration renewal date for each business license. Uh, did Nisha get on, uh, Village Administrator? Mayor, may I be recognized? Yes, go ahead. Nisha is on, um, okay. but I'll be reading her synopsis in regards to her department. Okay, let's go. Okay, so Village of Dalton License and Permits Department is seeking to amend the business license ordinance to change the business license registration and inspection to 12 months after the initial registration date registrations to 12 months from the initial registration date will permit inspections to not all be due at the same time as they are now and ensure that inspections can be done in a more efficient manner. The renewal of business license registration for the Village of Dalton License and Permits Department is currently due for all properties on April 30th and the renewal registration fees double by May 1st. 
changing the business license renewal registration to be due 12 months after the initial registration will increase the village's cash flow since the business will pay the entire amount of the 12 month fee for their initial registration at the time of registration. Regardless of when they initially register as opposed to a prorated fee as they do now, funding throughout the year versus all at the same time and be much more managed. Village of Dog License and Permits Department commends amending the business license to change the, the license registration inspections to 12 months. And then the Village of Dog has all business license renewal registrations due on April 30th, which I previously stated. So that means that the inspections are also all due around the same time. So it does not have a good effect on the cash flow. In addition, it causes a real burden for our inspectors to get the inspections done. Therefore, it would be more efficient for the village if every business license renewal due 12 months after their initial registration. Okay, is that the end of our report? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can I add something to that? Sure, go ahead. I just want to highlight the fact that with business licenses, they actually prorate. So if someone comes in in November, they will only pay for November and December um, but now with the change, we're changing it to 12 months. It's going to help our cash flow because we'll pay the entire dollar amount for that first year. Uh, and then they'll pay again when they renew 12 months later. Uh, they were prorating it so that so that they could change it to the first four months in, um, uh, in the following year and, and collect the full amount on April 30th. But with this change, if someone comes in when after this is approved, they will pay the full full 12 months. So it's going to help our cash flow uh, significantly by making this change. Thank you. All right. Uh, board, do you guys have any questions? All right, Clerk Key, Key can you call the roll for approval? But moving sure. forward. Right. Um, Trustee Steve. Yes, sir. Yes. Move forward. Trustee Norwood. I agree. Trustee Belcher? Yes. Trustee Brown? Yes. And Trustee House? Yes. Okay. Thank Move you. Move forward. All right. Um, next, we got discussion and possible action regarding an electronic system to manage Freedom of Information Act requests. Uh, this is uh, the clerk. Clerk, the floor. Hi. Is I finally speak. Good mm -hmm. evening, everyone. Um, I'll be very brief. It's been a long evening, so I will be very brief about this. But um, one of the things that I'm looking at and helping to make the clerk's office run more effectively is bring in a lot of electronic and digital things so that we're not dealing with so much paper and trying to tra track things manually. And in doing so, um, I had the privilege of meeting um, Phil Nani, who's on this call from Gov Q and A, and how this program, and I'll let him speak briefly in a second. But this is solely pertaining to Freedom of Information Act. I know a lot of you guys know that the number and the volume that's coming in is tremendous, and we just, I just want to be able to control them a lot more effectively to make sure I'm following up in a timely manner and that we're getting the answers so we're not in violation. I know uh, previously we've had a couple of lawsuits against the village because of not responding to foyers and not getting answers in a timely manner and being reported to the attorney general. And my goal is to not be reported to the attorney general for not responding to foyers. Um, again, Freedom of Information Act, because I'm saying it in short. Other municipalities is using this program, such as Harvey, Calumet City, Markham, just to name a few. And I would like Phil, who's on here this evening, to just talk briefly about this program. But before I let Phil speak, I also want to state that this can be funded through the American Rescue Act plan for the first year. So, Phil, if you'd like to chime in. Yeah, Are good you? evening, team. Yeah, can you hear me, Clerk Key? Yes, 
I can hear Beautiful. you. Beautiful. Well, you stole a lot of my thunder over there. You did a great job, and I appreciate that first and foremost. Um, but uh, good evening, Mayor, Board of Trustees, and the Village of Dalton residents. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here for a brief second to show you what GovQA's portal does look like for FOIA requests. So give me one brief second, and then let me know. You should see GovQA serving uh, three times more state and local governments. Beautiful. So I'm going to make this very quick, and then uh, we'll answer some questions here at the end. Um, but what GovQA does is we are a company out of Woodridge, Illinois. Um, but what we are trying to tackle here today is to help manage FOIA requests a little bit easier. Um, the slide that you're seeing here is from GovQA's data over a uh, nationwide span. And from what we're seeing is that the complexity of FOIA requests is uh, just increasing at a very high clip. 153% just over the last two years. Um, now, this is going to keep increasing. FOIA requests are going to grow organically, and we need to have a system in place to help everybody out just ma manage their day a little bit more efficiently. Um, this next slide does go into the American Rescue Plan Act funding. We can use these funds because we are bridging the gap between our government staff and the citizens within the village. So that is how we fall into the IT infrastructure category. Um, if anybody is looking for more information on the American Rescue Plan, Plan Act and how to utilize those dollars over there. GovQA does a great job and you can go to this website here in the red toolbar um, to find a slew of information for that. Um, here are some of the clients that we currently work with within the area. Uh, Calumet City, Oak Forest, Harvey, Tinley Park, Midlothian, Orland Park, Oak Lawn, and then Homewood is currently in contracting to come on board as our next client. <coughs> I apologize, Steve. Um, bear with me. I'm just going to show you what our public portal looks like and then the back end admin tool on just what it would look like from a whole point. Um, so this is going to be the homepage. We would design this to look like Dalton's website as it is today. Um, we are going to ask our citizens to provide an email address and password to protect all of their data. Once they start submitting all of that, we want to make sure that it is going back to the direct citizen that submitted that FOIA request. Um, I'm just going to submit my information. But overall, team, our system is built to help handle media requests, um, keep FOIAs in one central location. Um, and then we do have some tools in here to help self-service our citizens. So we have these broken out into a city and then a public safety side. I'll just do a simple request through the city side here really quick. As this form loads, it will ask some detailed questions to narrow down the scope of what this requester is asking. Um, different things within our dropdown to help narrow that scope. I'll just choose building. And then as I type in something that is located uh, specifically on the website or within public documents, uh, we can actually design landing pages to go directly to where that answer is. Um, government websites can be super confusing. So let's just cut out all of that extra information and drop that citizen exactly where they need it to. Let's say this request gets a little bit more complex and they're looking for an accident report as well. Um, as I type that in here, this is actually going to link with a different website where you can go access those accident reports right away. The overall goal here is to help with the transparency uh, with our citizens, but also to give them the answers right away as they want them. Um, as I scroll down the page here, you will see that we default to the Electronic Via Record Center, which is a very high-end compliance and secure portal located within GovQA. We do not have a file size limitation, so no matter how big that file is, you can share it directly with your citizen to keep all of that information protected. Um, overall, we're just going to submit this request. We do generate an automatic notification over here on the next page as we submit. That will generate a reference number so that we can track every FOIA request down to the T. The whole goal here is, is that we will never have a FOIA request slip through the cracks again. So that means no more lawsuits for the village of Dalton over there. That is something that everybody can agree on this call that we do not want to happen. Um, as we just go in here to the back end portal, what this will do is I have mine built out into the executive overview. There's a couple things that I want to see. What staff members are working on our FOIA request? here today. That will be down here in this pie chart. But then overall, you will start to see all of the updated and most open requests that we need to work on. So I can see by my staff members who is working on FOIA requests and exactly where they're at within the process. But then now I can come in here to my 30,000 foot overview of what I like to call every FOIA request in the system. I can see what departments I get involved with. This matches up with your state statute to let you know when the request is due, who the citizen is submitting the report, and then what they asked within the FOIA request. This is just to help with the efficiency. 
Overall, if we ever get a phone call in for a FOIA request, we can submit that information directly right here in the create a new request field. One more thing, I just wanna show you how quick and easy our redaction tool is and how we protect you on that. And then I will send this request back to the citizen and then I will get out of your hair here today. So as we come in, how we attach a document is just come to add file. All within a couple clicks, we will be able to get this report built into the backend tool. So you can either drag and drop or come anywhere within your server, upload the document, and now that lives within GovQA where you can start working on the redaction aspect. How our redaction tool works, all I need to do is click on the PDF, Word document, Excel file, any type of file can be brought into the system to be redacted. And all I gotta do is hit redact. Now I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly, but I can knock out any names, any patterns, anything that I want within this document. Frank Gaines was the first gentleman that I saw. I'm going to type in his name and now I can find him exactly where he is at within this documentation piece. This will help with the efficiency overall. And now I can actually label my redactive reason down here so that we do not have to get in touch with the attorney general for any of this information. Now we also do this by pattern recognition technology as well. I can search by credit cards, dates, email addresses, social security, phone numbers, any of those cases may be. I can come down in here and mass redact all of those out and then label those accordingly for religious info down the page here. Now, if we need to do any manual redactions, I can always cover up here and then label this accordingly. And how we protect you guys is we actually permanently delete the information underneath these redacted marks because there is software tools out there that can remove electronic redaction marks off of a page. So GovQA takes that extra step to keep you guys protected so that there is no more lawsuits. Overall, now this report will live within GovQA. The original document will always remain internal so that that does not slip through the cracks and go out to your citizen unredacted. Now, as we click on the redacted document, I do wanna show you this because I do think it's a little bit of an importance. As this updates here within the backend tool, you will see that all of our redactions do stick with on the screen. And then when I scroll down to the very bottom of our document here, you will see that we have a full redaction log to explain exactly what the reason was, how many times it occurred, and what that description of the redaction is. As I come over here, we will have all of your staff built into this system from day one. And how easy it is for me to get back in touch with the citizen, all I do is I hit this new message feature. This will have pasted response from clerk key already. I can choose a full release. This brings in all of the relevant FOIA information as the citizen described it. And then this will be uh, labeled directly with uh, clerk keys um, signature here at the bottom. You can go in and change the status of this FOIA request to the acceptable purpose. Uh, today, we're just gonna choose a full release. We are completed with this FOIA request, so we will store that on our end. And then you will always have access to all of the data because this is yours at the end of the day. Now I hit send message, that sends an email to our citizen saying that yes, you can return back to the secure server to access all of your documents that were shared directly with you. Overall team, that is going to be how our FOIA system works. You can bring in as many documents, you can get in touch with many departments as you want. Um, we are taking the Chicagoland by storm as you saw with a bunch of the uh, individuals that we partner with. But the whole goal here is, is to protect Dalton from start to finish keep you guys out of lawsuits and to make sure that clerk keys time over there is spent very valuable and very efficient at the end of the day. Phil, can you just quickly tell them how we charge for, uh, you know, after so many pages, they have to pay after the first 50 pages or things like that, how we will bill them for that? Yeah, absolutely. So we work with about 25 to 30 third-party payment providers. All you would need to do is select a fees and times. It is three simple dropdowns to create an invoice, and then we can send that directly to our citizen to be paid electronically. GovQA does not facilitate any of the funds. We will work with the third-party third party payment provider and your finance team so that you guys can recoup those funds from the FOIA requests. Thank you, Phil. Absolutely. Are there any questions? We'll figure it out when we get Okay, no questions? Okay. Um, can you call the row as it relates to moving forward for the board to vote for this? Okay. 
Trustee Steve. Aye. Move to move forward. Trustee Norwood. Agree with move forward. Trustee Belcher. Aye. Trustee Brown. Aye. And Trustee House. Aye. Thank you very much, board. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will provide you any additional information that it, you may need. Okay, next on the agenda is discussion and possible action regarding resolution 21 related to a new Toshiba copier for the Village of Dowd Police Department. Uh, Chief Collins. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor. Trustees, Madam Clerk, and any citizens that are on tonight. Um, just simply put, uh, this is, I'm bringing forward for discussion and your consideration, replacing the copier that's in our records department that is failing and is beyond repair. Uh, the proposal is for a 48th month lease. Uh, and the lease cost is $169.87 uh, per month. What that would end up being at the end of the lease term is $8,153.76. The other alternative is to do an outright purchase of $6,589.25, which is a savings of $1,564.51. At some point, this computer is going to fail on us and uh, we will be left without. So it's time to replace it. Okay, um, board members, any discussion? <clears throat> okay, well, my suggestion would be to do the purchase is what I'm suggesting um, so that he can have the copier. So let's do a consent vote to move forward with uh, purchasing a copy of clerk key. Call up. Um, trustee Steve? Yeah, let's move forward. Norwood, trustee Norwood? Aye. I'll, trustee I'll, I'll Belcher. Aye. Trustee Belcher. Aye. Uh, tr trustee Brown. Aye. And Trustee House. Aye. Okay. All Consent right. Thank you. Forward. Um, next on the agenda is discussion and possible action regarding a police force management system for the Village of Dowd Police Department. Chief. Chief. Thank you again, Mayor. What I'm bringing forward for discussion and your consideration is uh, to obtain a one-of-a-kind software that will help the police department in its transparency and um, push forward towards um, police reform. Uh, currently, the department, uh, we have an all-paper system for personnel records, 100% paper. Uh, but what also that this, I uh, also have a, um, a representative that will give a, a brief presentation in just a second. But what this uh, program will also allow us to do is store and view all officer performance in one central location. Right now, all it would take is a, a flood or a fire and it would destroy all personnel records and we cannot replace anything. Um, if we move to an electronic system, um, this system will also allow us to have an early intervention system. It will automatically track officer performance and behavior and at some point it will alert the command staff if there's a potential problem with an officer. So before an officer gets off track, we have a chance to intervene and bring that officer back into uh, back on track. Um, the, the software is quite powerful, it's pretty robust. And Boris, if you are on here, he is the representative, he can give a brief overview of what the software also entails. Boris, are you still with Thank us? You <clears throat> yeah, I can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, yeah. So thank you, uh, Chief. Appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Mayor and, and Board, uh, for having us on here. Um, I am actually going to have my director of partnerships, Chris Casula, kind of run through everything that we do. But, um, you know, we're, we definitely appreciate you letting us uh, jump on. Great. Uh, my name is Chris. Good evening, everyone. I really appreciate the time in the interest of uh, making good use of all of your time. I'll jump right into it. Who we are at Benchmark. So, uh, if we back up, the University of Chicago did research on patterns of behavior, behavior in law enforcement. And what they were trying to find is, can we identify who is an exceptional performer and who is potentially at risk for a problematic incident? Long story made very short, the research shows that this is a knowable thing. And based on that research, we can identify patterns of behavior. 
Now, what Benchmark did is we brought that research to market. And so as bringing that to market, what we found is that many departments also needed a way to capture that information to analyze it through the research. And so as Chief mentioned, we capture a variety of, of uh, things, performance evaluations uh, digitally so that you can have them in one place, not only so you can capture them more quickly and efficiently, but also so you, that you can report on them and get data out of the system more efficiently. Uh, when we think about departments that we work with, they're all shapes and sizes. So we work with Harvey, we work with Berwyn, we work with Cicero, we work with Lockport. So uh, we are also based out of Chicago. So this is, is home for us. Uh, when we think about what we do, it's all designed around 21st century policing, being able to create efficiencies, help you make data-driven decisions. And so we think about it in three buckets. The first, we're capturing information in this benchmark management system. So think of this as where you're entering information. We're capturing everything from equipment to training records. We're capturing force incidents, any type of complaint or notification from a supervisor, engagement with the community, department awards, uh, incident follow-up surveys, and then performance evaluations. All of this information is captured here in one place. Uh, when we look across the country today, you could be capturing this in 5, 10, up to 25 different databases, including paper. And so just consolidating this into one place is incredibly valuable. The second piece that the chief mentioned is the early intervention system. And so we'll take all of this information that your officers are doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and we'll look for patterns of behavior. And what we do is we use the research-based approach from the University of Chicago. Um, by the way, we are also partially owned by the American Institute for Research. So we are a research-based organization from top to bottom. This is a little bit of a unique piece because we understand not just what your officers are doing, but the context of the scenarios and peer group. And so what research shows is that this is the most accurate early intervention system. Um, we have almost a 90% improvement in false negatives uh, and almost a 70% improvement in false positives. Basically what that means is we are identifying the people that need help and we're not flagging people who are doing their job and doing a good job of it, right? So it's, it's predictive uh, and it's proactive in the way that we think about the research-based early intervention. The final piece then is, is care. And so if we think about it, the first piece is we're, we're capturing your information. The second piece is we're identifying patterns of behavior. And the third piece is how do we help get officers who are off track back on track? And how do we recognize and reward those that are doing a great job? And so this is ongoing research that we partner with the University of Chicago and the Joyce Foundation. The Joyce Foundation is also a, a, a foundation here focused on the Great Lakes region of which Illinois is part. And we have an ongoing research consortium which, help, which helps answers these questions. How can we provide positive, impactful interventions so that uh, we can make your officers get back to doing what they do best, which is uh, uh, making your community a better, safer place. So in a nutshell, that's what we do. Uh, I'll pause and see if there's any questions, but appreciate you having us out. Uh, and uh, Chief, thank you very much. Thank you. The uh, next part of this is um, costs. Obviously, there's a cost when you want to improve things in the police department. I want to continue to improve things in the police department and, and continue us moving, moving us forward to the 21st century policing. The cost of this full program is $10,000 a year. So the question is, how will I pay for it? Uh, what I did was apply for the Justice Assist grant, uh, Assistance Grant, which Dalton does receive every single year uh, to uh, cover uh, the partial cost of this program. And that grant that I applied for is $9,288. Now upon uh, when we receive that grant, that'll pay for a portion of it. The other portion I wanna pay for out of asset forfeiture funds. Asset forfeiture funds are seized funds, which we take from drug dealers, um, any other illegal activity, and those funds can be used for police use so that we not put an extra burden on the taxpayers. So all of this funding, um, and, and I will apply for this grant every year moving forward, uh, to uh, pay for this. Uh, do I have any questions that I can answer right now or any questions for these gentlemen that made the presentation? Okay, no questions. Mm -hmm. Can you follow the roll, Clerk Key? Sure, mm -hmm. Trustee Steve? 
Yes, I'm okay, move forward. Trustee Norwood. I don't agree with moving forward. Trustee Belcher. Aye. Trustee Brown. Aye. And Trustee House. Aye. All right. Approval to move forward. Moving forward on uh, discussion and possible action regarding resolution 21 dash for a class A requested for 14121 Martin Luther King Drive. Um, Board of Trustees, does anyone have any questions regarding J? Well, class eight. Is there any questions? Okay. Uh, Clerk Key, can hey, you hold on. Uh, roll, uh, oh, so moving forward? I do have a question. What, what business is that? What is that? 14121 Darmar King Drive, right across the street from City Hall, the other MB Financial Bank building. Any other questions? And who's, who's, uh, where are somebody, is that, who owns that now? Um, I'm assuming the bank still is on it. Yeah. So basically, uh, it's a buyer that's trying to purchase it and they want it to get a class eight contingent on purchasing the property. You, and you know the per, you know who's trying to buy it. You know, you know. Yeah, they, they're on here. Would you like to speak to them, or I was just trying to move the meeting along? Did you yeah. have questions for them? Yes. And it's in the resolution that you received in your board package as well. Is it, Mister Dasani? Let me see. Uh, hello. Uh, are you here? Good evening. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, good evening, Mayor and uh, Trustees. Thank you for this opportunity for this call. Uh, unfortunately, my my lawyer Adam is not able to to attend, but I can answer your questions. My name is Imran Desai. I work with the Rush University Medical Center, and I'm with the contract uh, uh, with with the bank for this property. And this property is closed uh, from last four years. And we are planning to have a, a, a corporate tenant over there, like a, like an insurance company, or or a, or a coffee shop, or some rental uh, rental property, like like a restaurants uh, or franchisee, um, fast food franchises, or something like that. Um, any any other questions regarding that? Uh, I am happy to answer. Any questions, trustees? Yes, Mayor, I'm happy to recognize. Okay, trustee Norwood. Um, I guess my my um only question, well, because obviously this will be his first time since he's the buyer. So this is the first time that they'll uh, receive a class eight. So I understand that part. I guess my concern or question is, um, are, are you interested in hiring Dalton residents or can we set something in place uh, for once, you know, we are situated uh, would Dalton residents be considered for employment for whatever uh, business that you open? Uh, yes. Yeah, so once uh, once there is a, some corporate, I'm sure they would uh, allow to have someone uh, from a local. Uh, but I cannot speak on behalf of them. But but uh, look at this. Uh, uh, my point of view is this property is closed from last four years, and and uh, we are bringing some corporate or some businesses over here. And it across the city hall, so I'm I'm sure you know there are people who will walk in. They, they for example, if there is a restaurants or, or, or fast food chain, there would be some kind of employment uh, for Dalton's. And also, this is a uh, this is uh, this is the closed property from for, for, for from last four years. So that will bring some positive vibe around the uh, around around that area. And I'm hoping that will also uh, uh, give some opportunity as a, like you are mentioning some employment and, 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 and the making a better environment for living, uh, living in Dalton. And also I, I would like to mention that I, I, I'm used to live in Dalton. I just moved last year, uh, last month from the Dalton to Forsyth because of uh, uh, employment. But yeah, I'm, I, I was used to live in Dalton too. Okay, great. I mean, cause that's my only concern. Um, you know, when, when we give out these class eights and, and, and I'm, I'm okay with that, I guess, you know, a main concern for us is just employment, making sure that employers do consider um, our Dalton residents. <clears throat> and, and that's yeah. it. So that's, that was my question. Thank you. Any more questions? I just have one. I know with the class eight, he's actually purchasing the property, mm -hmm. I guess for rental. So we don't really know what's actually going to go there. Correct? Right. Okay. Any more? That's questions? just my only concern. You know, once they get it, they've gotten it, and whatever they're going to put there, they put it there. So, 
you know, just moving forward, I would like for them to actually know what's going to be slotted for them. Yeah, well, it's slotted looking, in that, you know. He's looking towards a restaurant, which I'm totally for. Absolutely. Uh, boosting up the downtown area, putting like coffee shop or sit yes. down restaurant. I can't wait um, till we actually see that into fruition. But um, he did suggest that. So that's what he's looking for. Okay. That's Any it. More? Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Clark Key, can you call the row as it relates to moving forward for the class eight for 14121 Dar Luther King Drive, Jr.? Sure. Trustee Steve? Trustee Steve, you're on mute. Yes, approve. <laughs> Trustee Norwood. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with moving forward. Trustee Belcher. Aye. Trustee Brown. Aye. And Trustee House. Aye. All righty. Um, next, we have uh, Kay is being pulled from the agenda. Next, we have L, which is discussion and possible action regarding resolution 21 dash for a class eight requested for 14143 dash 14145 Darmar Luther King Drive Jr. Um, this is also a class eight. Is there um, the owner or? Hi, my name is Peter, Man Peter Manis. I work Peter with Manis. Rucker Holdings. Okay. And I did the submission to the city, the request and to the county for the submission for the class eight uh, application. Um, we currently have bought the building. We have made taxes current on the building and we're asking for the class eight because we think it's going to uh, cost approximately $200,000 to bring the building up to code and make it usable for uh, the intended purpose, which is an upscale cigar lounge. So we think we're going to be putting about one hundred fifty to two hundred thousand dollars into it. Okay. Okay. So um, there are some issues with what he was trying to do. I did speak to him as it relates to that, but I'll talk offline about it. That way, everyone don't know. But um, he has to address that in order to do what he's trying to do um, at that location. So I'll just address the class eight. Um, basically, board members, uh, do y'all have any questions as relates to that location receiving at Class 8? Uh, <clears throat> this is Trustee Belcher. Uh, okay. For disclosure, I will not be voting on uh, consensus to this to go to the next meeting because uh, I am an employer of the company that purchased it, purchased it before I became a trustee. But of complete transparency, I will be abstaining from any type of votes on this Class 8. All right. Duly noted. Um, do anybody have any questions as it relates to the class eight for 141 43 Darmon Luther King Drive? Yes, um, I have a question for him. Sure. Um, I know he's considering, uh, you know, he has some things that he's considering uh, for that location, but um, my, my question is always going to be do you have any um, ideas or are you? Um, okay, we're working something out where you're hiring Dalton residents or will it be, you know, um, any employment for Dalton residents there possibly? Yes, I don't see that as a problem. We will be hiring from the community. Okay, that's my concern. All right, thank you. Okay. Mayor, if I could be recognized. Sure, go ahead. Okay, I just want to ask, I believe I know the answer, but just for clarity, there, there will be no liquor license or no my understanding is not will be a liquor license or anything attached to this or any and maybe kind of discuss the crowd uh, that you are soliciting for this uh, for clarity no there will be no liquor license applied for or liquor served in the in the building okay do you have any idea what um, he wants to do with the building besides that because he did ask me about uh, putting that there and the answer was no at the current moment putting a smoke shop there so do you have well, a backup plan I, like what do we want to put there well i think it's not i guess is, is there an objection to it being a cigar lounge in it's in its in its entity correct okay if that's the intention with this with the community and that's what the village is desires then we'll have to look at some alternative 
applications. Could be a coffee shop, could be a couple of other uh, applications if we're unable to obtain a license from the village. But either way, the building needs to be renovated no matter what the use is. Um, and in order to do the renovation, we really need the class eight because we're, it'll take approximately $200,000 just to get the building where it's in a, a habitable situation. Okay. Any other questions on um, board of trustees? Nope. No. Okay. Uh, Clark Key, can you please call the road? To wait, 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 wait. Real, real quick, Mayor. Sure. Uh, be before, just before um, I'm, I make the vote and just to make sure I'm clear, we'll know, we'll be able, because this is just to know whether we're moving forward. So we can go back to him within the next two weeks and add some more information and see what he figured out in regards to what he his plans for for the um, area is before moving forward. The, right, yeah. correct. Yeah. Okay, so, all right, thanks man, that's what I was wondering. Get the intel, hopefully he's watching on here. Uh, Trustee Belcher works for him, so maybe she'll have it, you can get it from her and um, know what he's gonna put there. Cause I'll love to know that too. On uh, the downtown area, I love to see like sit down restaurants, uh, a little more jazz. Like when you go into other small communities, they got um, a ton of restaurants, which we need of sit down, not just carry out. So I agree. Any other Thank questions? You. All right. Um, Clark Key, can you Alrighty. call the road for approval for uh, moving forward with Class 8? Okay, Trustee Steve. Yes. Let's move forward. Trustee Norwood. I agree. I'm moving forward. Uh, Belcher abstained. Uh, Trustee Brown. I agree. And Trustee House. I agree. All righty. Okay. okay, next on the agenda is discussion and possible action regarding resolution 21 dash related to purchasing Bollert's uh, post for. Um, to place in front of Village Cafe at 14200 Dr. Mm -hmm. Martin King Drive, Jr. Okay, Trustee Belcher. Uh, good evening. Uh, Canella, is Canella still on? Yes, I'm still here. Okay, um, the, the owner of the Village Cafe is on and um, is gonna speak. Right. Hi, thank you very much. Hi, thank you very much for your mayor and village trustees. My name is Canella. I'm the owner of Village Cafe Restaurant um, on the corner. Um, in the last three years, there has been 12 accidents that have occurred in literally hitting the vestibule, which is the front part of the restaurant. In the eight months that I have taken over since my father has passed away, the restaurant was hit twice in a month. Luckily, um, nobody was hurt. About two weeks ago, again, I had my contracting team there trying to fix the vestibule, getting it back to not being closed. And my contractor literally said to me that he felt the heat of the accident behind him as he's on a ladder because an accident occurred as they were trying to fix it. So I'm just asking to see what can be done. I know it is city property, but to, to try to get some ballards on the corners there for the safety of pedestrians walking, the safety of patrons in the restaurant, and just all around the safety of the people. Okay, a um, couple things. Let's go to Chief Collins. Did you do a study on that location as of yet for accidents? There have been uh, quite a few accidents intersection related. Um, however, in a five year history, I did pull specifically just for one 4200 uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. Um, in there had been an accident that actually hit the building. Prior to that, uh, in 2018, there was a uh, traffic crash in which a car and a box truck and a pole were involved in uh, another accident back in 2018, a pickup truck uh, backed up into another vehicle. Um, however, the intersection has had quite a few accidents, but as far as um, almost hitting the building or hitting the building, I don't have any data except for the one actually uh, that did occur a couple months ago. Okay. 
Okay, so basically what we was trying to see was what was you in need of getting um, them placed. And then if you do decide to put them down, you will have to pay for them yourself. The village will not occur the cost. So I don't know if you have funds to put them in place yourself. And then also I refer to the attorney because normally people do an accident report to see if your site is warranted for um, placing them down. Uh, right now, what he just stated is you only hear one accident that actually went into the building. And I definitely feel your pain because if it was me too, I probably would want to put some kind of post or something up as well, but it will be at the expense of the business owner. So are you okay with paying for them or? Well, I didn't know which way this was going to go. I just don't understand because I have a police report from June. There was an accident in June of a car going into the building. And then there was an accident in July, a month later of a car going into the building. So literally two accidents in a period of a month. So I'm just not sure, I guess, how it wasn't reported when I have the accidents there. Like the, the, the car literally ran into the building. Um, one, it was worse. The July accident was a lot worse than the June accident. So. Okay. I guess my question would be, if you have that report, maybe you can give it to Chief Collins, because if he's stating in our system, we have no reports of a, of a vehicle going into your building. He's saying there's always accidents at that intersection is what he's stating. He's saying okay. that nothing as it relates to hitting your property. Is that right, Chief Collins? No, we can take a closer look at the data. Um, what I do have is just written data. I don't have traffic accident reports in front of me. Uh, that doesn't mean that the accidents don't exist. But I have, as far as May, there was an accident with injuries uh, associated with the address. And also June, there was an accident with injuries associated with the address. And I do know for a fact, one of those accidents actually did hit the building. And I'm not saying the other one did not hit the building. I just don't have that data. Okay. Uh, can I just say, I guess, cause this is uh, what was said. It should have been the corner of 142nd and Dr. Martin Luther King Drive because the Village Cafe is actually on the odd side, not the side where the um, uh, strip mall is. So I don't know if that makes a difference. And I'm just saying that just for clarity purposes, it was at the, the corner of 142nd Street, but the Village Cafe is on the odd number if however it was into. My apologies, not 14200. The actual address of Village Cafe is what I pulled, not 14200. You're right, trustee, that is across the street. I apologize. All right, thank you. No problem, thank you. Okay, so um, Ms. Ka is it Canela? Canela, yes. Canela, okay. Um, are you able to afford um, the post to put in front of your establishment? Um, I can't answer that at this time because I do not know the cost of how much the post will be. Okay, well, if you could um, let us know, I'm fine with you putting them there but you have to maintain them. So if someone runs into them, you have to fix it back upright. It can't be leaned over. So you have to keep it beautified, if that makes sense. Some people I notice do paint them yellow, things of that nature. So when you start getting chipped paint, you have to repaint them. So you just gotta keep them beautified on that corner if you do place them down. So I'm okay with it. Um, we can pull the board. Um, I'm pretty sure they'll support you uh, because who wants to see anyone get hurt inside of a building by just a traffic accident? So um, Clark Key, if you could pull the board for moving forward with her purchasing um, the post to put around her establishment. Well, the sure. corner, the corner, not, not all the way around. The corner, okay. <laughs> the corner, okay. like four of them. Okay, go ahead. Okay, Trustee Steve. Aye. Trustee Norwood. I agree. Trustee Belcher. Aye. Trustee Brown. Aye. And trustee house. Aye. Consent to move forward. Okay, there you go, Ms. Camilla. Um, just give us a call. And you can reach uh, Village Administrator Brown and um, get her the details when you're ready to move forward. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome in. You have to pull a permit for it too. Just want to throw that out there. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. Uh, next, uh, discussion regarding the painting of curves on Dominic King Drive. Uh, Trustee Belcher. 
Good evening. Um, this was just a discussion um, in reference to the um, the painting of the curves, which was uh, done from 142nd Street to 141st. Oh yeah, 142nd and 141st Martin Luther King Drive, because uh, initially only the west side of the build, uh, west side of the street was painted yellow, and the other side, the east side, wasn't. And I noticed that um, both sides are not painted yellow, which are in front of businesses. So I guess the conversation is. Uh, why are they painted yellow and how does that affect the businesses that's on Martin Luther King Drive? Okay, so I can respond to that. Um, the curves was painted yellow because they was painted in the previous years yellow. All we did was go back and repaint the areas that were painted. Um, when we was doing our walk, myself and Superintendent Stacy, basically business owners came out and asked us to actually paint the curves. Um, we was there really to look at different lightings and different um, things for the area. So when um, they came out, we did what we were supposed to do, which was paint the area. Uh, it's only one person that actually really had a complaint, which is the club uh, as relates to painting, which is one or two spaces in front of her location. Everybody else on that strip is really vacant further down. But the business district in front, the problem they're having is a lot of people are parking on the sidewalk. So half sidewalk, half street. So when it come, if you ever come down there when it's like really crowded, um, the car is parked, like I just stated, halfway on the sidewalk, halfway on the street, and then it's only one lane. So they have to turn if they want to go right, stay in that one lane in order to go right. Like if a bus or something come down, normally they can go to the right of the curve and then turn, but they can't. So that's the reason for why the curves are painted. Okay, Mayor. So um, just to be clear, the east side of the street has never been painted yellow until you painted it. If it was painted, and I'm just giving a synopsis, then I'm sure the business owner that has been there over 15 years wouldn't have had an issue of it being painted if they were painted previously before. Uh, I feel it. I feel adamant to say that three business owners on that street has complained about it. So for you to say they asked you to do it <laughs> seems kind of weird when I'm getting the calls and other trustees, I'm, so it's just not me getting the calls about this uh, this street being painted. My concern is now though, people that are going into this club or wherever the eye doctor, they have to park in residential area and walk to MLK to go to whatever business establishment because across the street is a private lot. That makes it difficult for businesses to maintain business. And I don't care if it's one slot or two slots that if it was there before, it wouldn't have been an issue. But that side on the east side of the street was never painted yellow except for where the bus party. Okay, so. So it's no signage there that says no parking, there's no nothing, no kind of sign is there. So um, somewhere it, it just happened. Okay, <laughs> so let me respond to you. So to address a couple of things you just stated. Number one, I already stated that it was already painted, which it was. On the other I, side, I mean, you saying that, but we already hey, know. Trustee, trustee, you gotta so. let me speak if <laughs> you wanna respond from me. Like how I was quiet when you spoke, thank you. So basically on the other side where the bus terminal is, no one ever parks there anyway. And yes, we did order signage. Signage have not came yet. So that's why you don't see signs up. And as it relates to you stating that um, a person has to park in residential area, untrue. Anybody that lives in the yeah, area, one second trustee, point of order, thank you. Anybody that lives in the village of Dawson knows that uh, anybody that goes to that club, they, they park across the street inside of the old Zion Church parking lot, number one. And number two, they park in their lot or the lot adjacent to their building is where a majority of their people park. So me painting a sidewalk um, just to get structure for the downtown area is not hurting anyone. Like I stated before, it is one space when I'm saying two, but it's only one space in front of Amy which is the club that we're complaining about. Other than that, everything else down there is really abandoned. The next thing that's down there is the eyeglass place, which actually is thankful for it because they will have signs that says 15 minute waiting. So 
when you keep saying paint, that's the reason why we paint. And then uh, I will I will allow uh, Stacy Correll to actually speak to this because he was with me when the business owner came out and asked us to do what I'm stating we're doing. I don't have to make that up. I don't just go down painting curves for no reason. So Stacy Correll, <laughs> if you could come yes, on. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't yeah, superintendent, please trustee. don't get involved in this. It, it ain't he it. involved. Excuse <laughs> me. Can, can I allow my superintendent to speak? Thank you. Go ahead, Stacy. <laughs> yes, Mayor. Uh, actually, the signs came today and the signs are posted as of now. They were posted oh, today. Great. Great. Uh, and yes, we did walk uh, to each business and speak with the business owners pertaining to the curves being painted. Thank you. So. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, so there is there no type of ordinance or anything that says you just go around paint? I mean, because if that's the case, like in this cul-de-sac where all these kids, people just park in the middle of the street, I'm going to go out there and paint it yellow. So I just need to know. <laughs> I just explained it to you, trustee. I didn't go just paint anything yellow. He just explained it to you. But no, you okay. initially said that it was already painted that, which well, you knew it was never paint, painted. It was never paint painted was yellow on the east side of the street. They, uh, right, on the side where the bus terminal's at, the <laughs> bus terminal. What was painted was on the left side where the businesses were. It was already painted. All they did was repaint what was painted. That's exactly what they did. Now, no, the they did not. That is basically what we did paint. They did paint that, but no one parks there anyway because it's a bus stop. It's a bus terminal. Mayor, you paint you all up inside on the east side of the street, which is yellow, where there's no, it was never any signage there that said no parking, loading, zoning, or anything. On the east side of Martin Luther King, has never been painted yellow. It was the west side that has always been painted yellow. Trustee, I just explained it. I ain't gonna keep going back and forth. So that's fine. That, that's your response. Can I be recognized, that's your response please? as it relates to why and how it got painted. So I mean, it was ahead, no, okay. Me okay, and I think my my question is uh, uh for um, Attorney uh, Rains is in in this one because there are I think I, I've gotten a couple of calls from a couple of business owners too. If it was the desire of the board to um, not have that as a parking, uh, I mean, allow parking on there, is that something that would be subject to board vote or is that not subject to a board vote? Parking restrictions are subject to board vote. Parking restrictions would be by ordinance. Right. Thank you very much. So do we have, Attorney Rains, do we have an ordinance that says that the other, the uh, east side of the street of Martin Luther King Drive, which was formerly Chicago Road, was a no parking zone and painted yellow prior to when it just happened. That would have to be something verified with the clerk if there's an ordinance already on the books that predates uh, today or the day that it was painted. And if, it's, and if it's not, then what is the ramification of people parking there or getting tickets or anything? What is the legal ramification of that? Well, there's if also not an ordinance. There's also no. state statute which prohibits parking at certain within a certain amount of feet of an intersection. So I would have to look at the intersection to give you an opinion about. Okay, what would this happen. is the whole right, but this is the whole street. So that's what the question is, and how how long would this take for us to get the answer? Because again, uh, I'd have to. I get don't want to be. Ordinance. I don't want to be considered a liar or giving in, in, uh, untruthful information. So I want to make sure that the next board meeting or special board meeting that we have, that is clarity that it was never painted on that side of the street. That would be something that if you contingent upon when the clerk is able to dig through the old ordinances to pull it up. Okay, Clark Key, when you get a chance, could you please pull that ordinance for me? If I there will is check one. to see if there is an ordinance and um, I'll make sure the attorney and yourself and the mayor uh, receive a copy of it. Okay. Thank well, you so much. Thank it. you. I just need people to understand that when I make a decision or make a move, I'm not doing it to just paint curves. If people ask me to do something, I come and I take care of the business for the business district or the residents. Uh, curves was painted before, they got painted again um, due to the fact the paint was already on the ground. So for a club owner to make all this noise about 
uh, can't get a parking space in front of their building, um, that's a problem when they park literally across the street or in the lot. So um, if you guys have a problem with me beautifying the downtown area or issues like that, um, you guys know my phone number. You don't have to make a spectacle of it up here at a board meeting over curves being painted. We got bigger and better things to deal with than arguing over painted curves. Okay, moving on. Next, I have... Discussion and possible action to consider another vendor to replace Paychecks Corporation to handle the payroll of the village of Dalton. Uh, Janice Johnson. Janice, you're on. You got to unmute your, your, uh, your phone. Janice. There Hello? You go. Yep, me there. Okay, yes, Mayor. I'm going to pass this over to Chris. Chris, are you on? Uh, at the request of the village, we have started, we will be reaching out to three different payroll companies to transition from paychecks to, uh, to eliminate paychecks as your guys' payroll provider. Okay. The companies we're going to be reaching out to are... Uh, Paycom, Paycor, and ADP. Okay, so you will have that ready for next board meeting? Depending on how long they take to create a presentation, I can't predict how long it will take for a presentation. There is, however, it, the transition, it, there is significant of, after the board makes the decision, there is significant time in the setup of whatever new payroll company the village decides to go to. Okay. All right, any questions, um, Board of Trustees, as relates to switching companies from payroll? I have, uh, this is Trustee Brown. Sure. I'm sorry, this is Trustee Brown. Okay, did Paychecks ever send any information as to what caused this error? That will be Janice or Chris. Go ahead, Chris. Okay, so uh, Janice and I have worked through with Paychecks to determine what happened. So on the August 27th payroll, Everyone was paid as normal process. Then Paycheck submitted their ACH for their payment. Uh, Janice, for whatever reason, it didn't come through. She didn't see it, so she didn't approve it. On August 30th, uh, Paycheck notified the village and, and me that the payment was bounced back. Uh, I spoke with Jan. She emailed the Paycheck representative saying, please resubmit, and we will make sure we approve it the second time around. On September 7th, they uh, emailed Janice saying, okay, Janice, we will resubmit. On September 8th, we received notification that it didn't go through, that it was kicked back. On September 9th, they notified us that we would have to do a wire for payroll to, be for, for, to make payment on this bill. Throughout this entire process, no one ever said that um, the non-payment of this outstanding invoice would create a holding of payroll. The issue that was created, the reason why the second time around when they submitted the invoice for approval, it was not approved was because when they submitted it to the village, they used the wrong routing information number. They used the routing information number under uh, MBBA Financial instead of Fifth Third Bank, which is why Janice never saw it to approve the invoice. Due to the frustration and inconvenience this has called the, caused the village, paychecks will be um, crediting the village for the next two payrolls, their fees. So the village will not have to pay any fees for the next two payrolls for paychecks. Okay, I got a question. Go ahead. Okay, if it bounced back, no one was aware that it bounced back both times? The first time they sent us an email saying that and we, we consult, I responded to them saying, please resubmit and we will confirm. The second time it came back, they, they submitted it. They didn't submit it to the village. They submitted it to the wrong in, a routing number. So we never got notification that it came to us. Okay, the second question with that. How long have we been using paychecks for them to have the incorrect routing number? Well, Fifth Third only changed in May. Uh, we only changed from MB Financial to Fifth Third. I think it was May of 19. And this was the first time this issue ever came up. So. I don't know how they had the wrong route, typed in the wrong routing number. It was human error. Okay. So we didn't get anything in black and white, I'm saying from paychecks, as to moving forward until we get someone else 
what what would take place if this happens again before we um, go to the new vendor they it will not happen again they deleted from their from the system the mb financial references so they can't this can't happen again because they've deleted the mb financial information from the system okay thank you chris yep i, I got a question um sure. is there a way to if I mean, I maybe I don't know if we can do this or just a question because I'm sure you know some people who really uh, are check to check sometimes, and if if they are if they had insufficient fund fees and anything that because they didn't get that check at that direct deposit that they can bring that to the village and we can kind of handle that. If somebody had something hit their account that was they knew they thought they were going to uh, get that check and they didn't. Yeah, let me respond real quick, Chris. Um, from my understanding, we didn't have that situation happen because they did get paid in a timely manner. So they got their check, I believe it was around one or two o'clock, Chris, it was in that time frame. So um, if anything hit the bank account, it would have got paid. Because normally the problem was everybody's upset that they didn't get their money, I, I, which I didn't know at 3 a.m. I don't know who up there early, but normally they say that the money hits the bank, their bank account at 3 a.m. So all this came about um, about eight, about eight a.m. I started getting calls. Yeah, I started getting calls. Eight a.m., nine o'clock. When we got to the office, we tried to rectify the situation. And then what he's telling you is what exactly what happened. Okay. Go ahead. Mayor, can I be recognized? Sure, go ahead, Trustee House. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I kind of want to chime in. So um, I think on this uh, situation, I think it was a really difficult one. I really, it's highly irregular from my experience that a payroll company would not perform this duty over a minimal amount of money. So I'm very disappointed that they've done, that they did it. So if some steps were missed, uh, I, I'm not saying that steps were, but for a marginal amount of money, I think any uh, reputable company would have worked with the village and made sure that employees got paid. I think that's a really serious matter. Um, I would commend um, in particular with Chris and uh, Ms. Johnson, I think that they did jump on things very, very quickly um, as a board. And the mayor, I know everybody saw this as a huge issue. And I think we just want to make sure that the employees know that we value them so that it was rectified that quickly. And I think that moving to a different company is the right solution if um, that minor of oversight would cause, that, cause paychecks or the company that we're with. I can't remember the name at this moment, mm -hmm. long meeting. But I think that uh, seeking a new vendor is the appropriate answer to make sure that a uh, statement is made that we're not gonna accept that kind of service. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Okay, um, any other questions? Okay, moving forward to discussion and possible action on ordinance number 21 dash regarding public assembly for the village of Dalton. Uh, Chief Collins. Thank you again, Mayor. Uh, this may look familiar because this did come up before. Um, I'm presenting it again because I think it is important to the village moving forward, not only for now, but also the future of the village. Uh, I'm going to read from the synopsis. The village of Dalton has experienced multiple protests, demonstrations over the past three months. The concern is not that the protests occur, nor is there concern with the subject matter. The major concern is that the police department is not notified of the public assembly, thus not allowing an opportunity to, uh, opportunity to assess the health, safety and welfare of the public due to the assembly. With a lack of notice regarding a planned protest or demonstration or assembly, all officers on duty are compelled to respond to the location of the assembly due to the potential of civil unrest. In addition to other safety concerns, this alone deprives the citizens of the village of Dalton access to the normal daily services provided by the police, such as patrols, investigating criminal activity, and responding to calls for service. Public safety is severely compromised by not having an adequate number of police officers on hand to respond to a public assembly while continuing normal patrol operations. This also compromises the safety of the Village of Dalton police officers by not having enough officers available to handle potential volatile situations. Additionally, by not providing a notice of a planned public assembly, the Office of the Chief of Police is not afforded an opportunity to assess the location of the gathering to determine if a significant public safety issue exists or to determine safe routes for pedestrians and vehicle traffic. I am hoping that over the past couple of weeks that the decision makers have taken an opportunity to actually read through the ordinance 
nowhere in the ordinance does it impede or stymie anyone's uh, personal liberties or their First Amendment rights. All we're simply asking is just to be notified of the assembly so that we can be properly prepared. That is it. Thank you. Okay, any questions from the Board of Trustees? Okay, um, so do, let's see. Can you uh, poll the board as it relates to move forward with this ordinance, uh, Clerky? Wait, 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 real quick, Mayor. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Trustee Norwood. Um, I, I had a question prior to moving forward. Um, I know we had discussed this um, at the last board meeting, and I just want to make sure I'm clear on a few things. The stipulation that we had in place was what? That the protesters had to notify uh, the department in time? Was it like five days prior to them protesting? That's correct. Oh, and, okay. and it's not just protesters, it's any public assembly. That's why I said it's important for the village moving forward. Not just demonstration and protesters, but any group that wants to gather, I think you would want the, your police officers to be properly notified so that we can be able to respond to anything that may happen in that group. And yes, ma'am, it is five days. Also included attachments, and I hope uh, that it was included with your board packet, that this is, this is not just unique to the village of Dalton. All over the United States and all over uh, um, municipalities within the state of Illinois, there is some type of ordinance or something on the book that deals with public assemblies, crowds gathering, what crowds can do. And without any other um, legislation, even the state of Illinois has a law about demonstrating. Okay, got you. And, and, and just so I'm clear, um, I have you, Chief. So with this, I think there was a few things. Um, they had they had to no, be not, notify you all within five days. Um, they had to get like a permit. Was it? No. I'm saying no. no permit, just notify you all? No, there is no extra burden other than the notification in writing. Dear Chief, we'll be assembling at such and such location on such and such date at a particular time. And without any other action, the assembly is allowed to occur. Okay, and, and for whatever reason, if it's not, uh, if they did notify you in five days, what happens? Then the, organiz the organizer or the organizers of the gathering can be fined. Gotcha, okay. Okay, all right, thanks Chief, I think I answered. All right. Anybody yeah. else? Okay. Mayor, if I can be recognized. Trustee, yes. Okay. Yeah. On this one, I, I do, um, I've had an attorney review this too. I do, I do still have some concerns about just the, the constitutionality of this item. So I'm mindful of the um, safety of the police officers and I hope I want everybody to be safe. Um, but I just think that there are still questions that I, unresolved questions that I have about that, about the constitutional um process of it so at this moment I would not support it but I do think we want to be mindful and I think a lot of the uh, protests that have come uh, using just idea I think we have a good idea when when they're coming and what the issues are uh, so while I'm looking at the, the constitutionality of it I want to just say I hope we're safe and cautious with the events that we do plan because uh, I think there's um, outstanding issues that we just have to get resolved that will eliminate some of the protesting. Okay, anyone else? Okay, um, can you pull the board for um, oh, sure. approval? For moving sure. forward with this, thank you. Um, Trustee Steve? No. Trustee Norwood? No. Trustee Belcher? No. Trustee Brown? No. And Trustee House? No. Okay, next on the agenda is discussion and possible action regarding reconsideration of increased rates for services rendered in the housing department. Um, that will be uh, Ms. Harris. Are you there? Mrs. Harris? Sandra? Okay, go ahead, Trustee House. Yes, I'm here, I'm sorry. 
Okay. Uh, thanks. I'm glad you're here because I was going to ask a few questions, but um, <laughs> I asked this one to come back up, come um, for reconsideration uh, on August. I want to say it was August 2nd meeting uh, or, or early August. Uh, we had a meeting and there was a there was a motion and a vote put up to increase the rental inspection fees. From my understanding, it increased from one hundred to two hundred dollars. So please, uh, Sharon, correct me if I'm if I'm incorrect with that per unit. OK, so uh, it's two parts. So we have a single family home that is currently eighty five dollars per year, which is fifty dollars for the license and thirty five for the inspection. Mm -hmm. So the proposed rate increased is. For the single family home, we're going to start there. $100 for rental registration, $100 for the inspection. Mm -hmm. And okay. then when we have multi-unit properties, it's $75 per unit. And then still the registration fee of $100. Okay. So on the multifamily says, the, is that the new rate or is that the previous rate? That's the new rate. The previous rate is always $35 for each inspection, even if it was a multifamily. Okay. And I, so this was one, and I think I may want to do a little bit more because I didn't understand that split. I, I was going on the single family um, information, but uh, rather, and I bring this back up for a discussion, I would say uh, I've gotten some calls from, uh, from residents that uh, we moved on this without having a public discussion, kind of like the one we're having now, mm -hmm. and get uh, feedback as well as I'm um, thinking about the uh, implications. So I guess I may want to ask uh, board members or anybody else if they've had uh, conversations on this, and then I want to look at uh, potentially revisiting the cost structure and what that what implications that would have on our uh, financials. Okay, so let me jump in real quick. So if you guys look in your package. Um, she did put together a analysis as it relates to different municipalities. So it tell you kind of the threshold where everybody's at. We was below the amounts that everybody else is charges. Um, um, do you see it, um, Trustee House? So you can go through it with me. Um, I don't have it in front of me at this moment, but if you bear with me. And actually, I'm not even asking that we move forward with anything just at this time. I'm really on discussion. I will be looking further into this. Uh, I may potentially ask ask for um, re a revision on the rates, but um, so but I was bringing it up for a discussion because residents asked, and we did uh, make this we did put this up, and as a board we voted for it and did not. And for me, I'll say I apologize because I did not get resident feedback, so I wanted to make sure that uh, re residents had an opportunity to give information and then also hear what the discussion is. But if I'm the only person that's gotten those. Uh, concerns. Um, I, I would like to know that as well. Yeah, understood. So, real quick before I go down the line, I just want to go over this fee structure. So, if you look at the chart, if it says City of Harvey, they charge for their registration fee one hundred thirty dollars two times, meaning twice a year. So they charge two hundred sixty dollars per year. We only charge one hundred dollars per year. And if you look at Orleans, Orleans at fifty. You look at um, South Holland, they're at 75. And if you look at Matson, they at 100 all the way to $300. So I just want you to compare all the different amounts. And the same thing if you go per unit. Per unit, we way beho below the threshold. So per unit, we was at $35, and now we're at $100. And for, um, what is it, South Holland, South Holland is at $75 per inspection, per unit. So all we was trying to do was just um, make money. And then if you look at Orland, Orland's ahead, dang, they charge three different times. They had $450 uh, per unit. And then if it's a multi-unit building, they had $600 per unit. So I just want you to understand how it's going as it relates to each uh, municipality. So no one will think that we're um, charging too much because we way beho below the threshold. So I'm for the increases and the reason being this is investment properties this don't harm our homeowners this is strictly for someone that comes into town purchases a building or a house and they rent it out because your job as an investor is to figure out how to get your expenses back one way to get your expenses back is to a uh charge an application fee like most um landlords do so you got options on how to get this money back so i don't want us to start constantly decreasing 
something because you get one or two complaints. Um, most people that I did speak to all, all are for it because no matter what, it's an investment piece. You in the market to make money. So I, I hear some of them that, that you're saying that not for the increase in rate, but we have to make money somehow, somewhere at the village. Other than that, we'll start attacking or attaching the fees to our homeowners, which I'm not for. So we started with the investors, which has have the money because they rent the units. And a lot of times, half of them don't keep up the units. So we got to charge something so we can't send um, the inspectors out. And that's a way that we do pay for their salaries. So I just want to put that out there for the board. Okay, uh, board of trustees, uh, anybody got any uh, questions, concerns, comments? Yeah, yeah, ma'am, I'm being addressed, ma'am. Right, go ahead, trustee Norwood. Um, <clears throat> so as just to, um, as in regards to trustee house comment about uh, residents calling. So I have had a few residents contact me um, regarding the increase. Um, so it is a concern and I think as I explained to you earlier, Mayor, um, because of things like this I, and, and because of the length of this meeting and, and because of timing, um, per, for time and purposes, I, I won't go get too detailed, but I really do think that we need a housing committee because these type of changes will be where we discuss it um, as a board, as a whole, and then we'd have a housing meeting where we could get the residents input um, and then we can move forward on it. So. Again, um, I just think that if we had housing a housing committee, this would be something that would go there and be discussed in a housing committee. And we would not be, you know, spend so much time on our regular meeting trying to figure things like such as this out. So um, again, I just think that we need a housing committee so that we can all discuss things like this. It, it can be transparent for the residents, for the um the investors and for us so that we could all be on one page in regards to the changes. So I do think that um, I'll personally, I did receive a list from you um, of the different municipalities and their uh, fees. So I'll go back and I'll revisit and I'll do some comparing and then I'll go back to the board members and just see what, what they're thinking so that we can revisit this because our residents were concerned and um, I'm glad he brought it back up because I don't want the residents thinking that uh, we don't hear them because we don't. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. And you and I spoke about um, the housing committee. Everybody <laughs> keep coming up here saying that. You yeah. And I spoke about that earlier on mm -hmm. what we're going to do. So we are just shock them. So um, moving forward, I just want everybody to still take into consideration that this village is a business as well. Every complaint that you do receive as it relates to lowering prices, we cannot always do. Some things you have to stay firm on and make sure that the village do make money to pay for our staff and our overhead. So I just want to make sure everybody was um, clear on that. Um, any other comments to this? So we can move I just forward? have one, Mr. Trustee Brown. Sure. sure I ahead. know we need the increase because it would also bring in revenue, mm -hmm. but I too have heard from residents as well. Mm -hmm. I think we should do it gradually. And that's just me saying that, that it should be done gradually. You know, some people say, well, okay, you went from 50 to 100 or you went from 35, you got a $65 increase. So yes, raise the uh, fees, but let's probably do it gradually so we can get to where we actually want to be. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? All right. Uh, moving forward to Blocker, you're next. Uh, presentation regarding submission of a customer request through the Village of Dalton New Hope help desk system. Derek Blocker, you're on. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Good evening. Uh, so uh, we have implemented a new online system, help desk system for tracking uh, concern, resident concern. And it's a ticket system. So when residents' complaints come in, mm -hmm. they'll receive a support ticket and the issues will be routed to the correct department and then the issues will be handled. They will receive um, email notifications, notifying, you know, letting them know that the complaint or concern or whatever was received, and there will be communication going back and forth between them and the department through the system. Um, I have, I can kind of go through it real quick, or I can just create a little video thing and have it posted later to give residents uh, um, a little instruction on how to use the site, because there are several ways that the tickets can get input into the system. The mm -hmm. first is if um, through the, the um, customer service phone number, if someone calls in, 
the personnel are into them into the system. If emails are sent to the complaint email and the suggestion for mayor email, it'll also automatically get input into that system. And also there's a front end website where residents can go and enter the ticket themselves. So I can either go through that real quick or I could just create a little video or something and have that posted on the website. Okay. Um, Board of Trustees, would you like him to go through it or do anybody understand what it is he's trying to accomplish? Uh, trustees, or do y'all have questions for Derek? I, I understand. If he create create a video, that'd be great. I understand what he's trying okay. to do. Okay, everybody. Okay. Um, do you want to... Uh, Clerk Key, can you call the board to see about moving forward with Derek's... Uh, sure. Yeah, help us. Uh, uh, trustee Steve? Yes, I'm okay. Move forward. Uh, Trustee Norwood? I agree. Trustee Belcher? Is Trustee Belcher on? Trustee Brown? I agree. Trustee House? I agree. Trustee Belcher? Hear me? Oh, now I can't. Aye. Okay, thank you. All right. Next, we have a discussion of possible action or ordinance number 21 dash regarding block by block programs to sell vacant houses in the village of Dawson. So for many of you that don't know me, um, I've been a trustee for eight years. In my eight year uh, discovery, I have made a program called block by block. And what that entails is putting all the vacant properties back on the tax road. So I structure it where you can buy a house for a dollar or you can buy a house for $5,000. Um, I bought this up as mayor and I tried to initiate that in the last uh, couple months prior to this. And I told the board to basically go and tell me what you want to change, implement, add to, take away as related to this program that I did structure. Uh, right now, we are here at this moment, and I'm going to host a town hall meeting, which is next week, um, Wednesday, to talk about block by block. Um, I'm asking the board of trustees to join me and also um, tell me what it is that you guys want to put in to this program. I don't know if any of you guys did any homework on it or know what you guys want to do with it, but please just let me know ahead of time. And just for the sake of time, we're not going to go through block by block. I just want you guys to either email me or we can meet um, over the next couple of days coming up to talk about block by block program. Um, that's really just the statement I wanted to make. So everybody know where we're going. So we can give it back to the community. The community can chime in and um, go from there. If anybody wants to come in and get a sample of what that structure looks like, you can come into Village Hall and then I'll just read it into record. And then we will move on and uh, pull what it is that I already structured. I talked to some of the trustees already <clears throat> as it relates to um, block by block, but I want to read. Clerk Brown, can I get the um, block by block uh, set up, the structure? The flyer. I, was in my, I thought it was in my little piece. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to read this into record so everybody that's watching understands and know what we are trying to do. So it's called Block by Block uh, Housing Program. So for the free houses, it was for strictly for investors. The qualifications was proof of funds of 20K, um, licensed and bonded contractor, which you must have, a 90-day permit, and then you will receive a housing inspection, which is the initial and the final. Um, additional fees will um, apply only if you fail the inspection. You have to pay again. Escrow is only $1,000. And that's crazy because when I first came into office, escrow was on a sliding scale. So we made it a flat fee of $1,000. Uh, lotteries for investors, that means you would pull a number. And then I had a structure where it was a 75-25 split, which means 75% goes to the investor, 25% goes to the village. Um, and of course, budget is unforeseen. So that means you need to make sure that you actually budget for things that you don't know. So sometimes you tear down a wall and then you can have rotten wood behind it. Um, you can have a family of raccoons and then know you have to do a roof tear out. So things of that nature for those that's not in this field. Um, that's why I'm saying that you have to show that you have money to do the projects. A lot of people see houses and see a dollar program and everybody jumps on it. But the problem with that is 
half the time people do not have the money to do the work. They think they can get the property and sit on it for months or a year. We are not trying to do that here in the village of Dalton. We're trying to see these properties back on the tax roll within six months. An investor must sell property. And the reason why we structure it that way is because we did not want to continue with renters. We're trying to make homeowners in the village of Dalton. We don't want you to come in and just uh, buy a house and then you keep putting renters throughout our town. So that was the structure for um, free houses for a dollar for investors. And then I suggest that everybody, no matter whatever you do in your life when you buy a house, get you a private inspector. And the reason being because they will find things that you do not know or that you don't see. Sometimes you can find um, well, how you eye on a house and it looks good from the outside, but come to find out an inspector goes in and the whole house is sinking. So things of that nature. So that's what I'm saying. Get you an inspector so you will know the do's and don'ts. And then on the other side of the program, the web structure was for $5,000 for owner-occupied. What that entails is you must be a Dalton resident. You must live in the house for five years. You must complete the repairs within 90 days, must pull a 90 day permit. Um, you must get a housing inspection, of course, initial and final. Your escrow is only $500. So that means you got money to do the work. It was a sliding scale as well, but it is only $500 for escrow. It, it also is a lottery for residents. So we pull a number. Of course, the budget is unforeseen. And again, I suggest that you do a private inspector when you buy the home. Um, homeowner training is, is needed um, when you fund a buy a house. Sometimes people just don't know how to live in a house because sometimes people have been in all their lives that they don't understand the upkeep of a house. So we have issues in Dalton as it relates to uh, overgrown weeds, um, broken out windows and things of that nature that people can't afford to fix. So just so you know, that, that was the structure. Um, now, right now, myself and the board of trustees is just trying to put together the guts of the program as it relates to who will oversee it. Um, when, how do you qualify, which I kind of like hit on it a little bit, and then what will be the process, and then what properties will be, um, and is it free and clear? All the properties are free and clear. That means no back taxes on it, no mechanical liens. It's a free and clear title, and I always try to encourage people to uh, put money back into your child. That's home ownership. You got a house, instant equity of, I'm just making numbers up. It could be 60000 but a $100,000 house at $5,000 for your child. So, of course, don't nobody ever really move out of town normally when you raise your your family inside a small town like dog you normally um the kids will grow there too sometimes we leave because it's too cold or the weather or whatever but majority of the time we all stay here i just want to put that out for the record but we are discussing this um as it relates to myself and the board of trustees i will be having a town hall meet next week uh, Trustee Norwood said she wanted to do a housing committee. Uh, we spoke today and we will be doing a housing committee as well. So um, you'll hear more about this in the upcoming next two weeks. So I just want to put that out there for the record. And because what time is it? Oh, that was a lot. It's 10 o'clock. Hey, so, if I can, really briefly, uh, next Wednesday, we did have the finance committee meeting scheduled for 530. So uh, I 530. heard about Okay, town my town hall meeting, I think is at 7 or 730. So you're meeting okay. like 30 minutes, an hour or so? Yeah, 30. it shouldn't be any more than an hour. Thank you. Okay, Okay. cool. Um, so be, I'm going to go recognized. to the... What was that? May I be recognized? Yeah, go ahead. I understand, I understand that you really want this program, but the needs. The, this needs to go to a committee. Period. Uh, trustee, okay, hold on, pause. Let me, let me, let me finish, let me finish my statement. Wait a minute, because I just said all of that because I didn't want to go back and forth. So I want to get to the last item so we could go. I, we so, can't rush through this major thing. That's a major piece of we legislation. We didn't rush through it. Rush all through I it. did was read you, you, the record. You, you, what you, we did had. A, you did a sales pitch and you don't rush through it. You got to at least let it let let us speak on it for our airport. That's why it's on the agenda for us to discuss. So, okay, go ahead. That's why it's on the, the committee to hold meetings. We discuss this thing. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is that we can have a town hall meeting. You can have all that. If you don't have the board vote to push this legislation through, it will, it will go nowhere. It will be off for not. You just have a town hall meeting just to sell, make the sales pitch. You have to sell it to the trustees. And the trustees, I can speak for myself, it needs to go to a housing committee. And you can establish a housing committee, but I think we need to establish our own housing committee. So <laughs> moving forward, moving forward, that's what we're going to do. We're going to have to, we're gonna have okay. to do that. So okay. like I said, you can we can have a how we can have a town hall meeting, we can talk about it, you can sell it, but it's up to the trustees to pass it. That's what we do. We legislate, right? Mm -hmm. We legislate. So that's a legislation that you want passed, we're gonna have to pass it. So what I'm saying is that we're gonna have to have a we're gonna have to have a committee to actually go through it and we can actually make this as transparent as possible. Not a town hall. You can have a town hall meeting, please, you do. 
we you can we can all come there. It's still gonna come to the trustees that have to pass. And you know that from being a trustee for eight years, it's gonna come to the trustees. Okay. So now let me respond to you. Because I made my statement and I guess you missed all of that. I just stated that I spoke to trustee Norwood as related to a housing committee. So I guess you missed that. So I guess I'll say it again. So we're doing a housing committee. So stop saying what I ain't doing. I'm having a town hall meeting regardless of with you or without you. It's already structured on my calendar to talk to the people like I always do. All I just stated was that I'm going to include block by block program as I relate my message to the people. So as it relates to you, I included you. I said, you guys can join me if you like. If you don't, then don't. But all I'm saying to you is that, yeah, we all got to talk. Yeah, at a previous meeting, you, trustee Steve, all said move forward. And then when I did move forward, everybody paused. Don't do this. Don't do that. So then I backed up and I kept pulling it from the agenda. Then I said, board of trustees, would y'all please add to this, change what you want, Put whatever you want into it so we can't move it forward. Because all we do is keep talking about it, but ain't nobody doing nothing about it but me because I keep putting it up. But no one's structuring anything. So, like, what's your ideas for? What do you want to do with it? No one got nothing. But every time I bring it up, it's just shot down. But no one got no direction on how we should do with the vacant props. And that's my issue. So that's why I'm asking the board once again. Look at this. You don't hear me ask for no vote for this right now. I didn't even put it to y'all. I just made my little comment and I moved on. I'm saying to you again, trustee Steve, look at this. Find out what you want to do, you, and add it in there. I can care less what you want to do, but just fix it. Do it. I'm saying come with a plan. Stop always shooting everything down. And ain't nobody got a plan as it relates to putting the vacant properties back on the tax roll. Yes, we talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, and it goes nowhere. So what I'm saying to everybody on here is please, guys, come up with some solution as it relates to putting a housing program together. I have structure already is all I keep saying. So now add to it. Take away from it. Whatever you choose, but come come together somehow, some way. It's getting cold. So what are we going to do? Just keep paying the people to go cut the grass, put the bushes down, and we not putting nothing back. We ain't bringing no revenue in the village. We ain't, we ain't making um, none go back on the tax road. We ain't doing nothing. And that's my issue with, with my board. So that, that's where we at with it. So that's why I said I'm going to make the address. Okay, hold on one second. Dow's going to make the statement and then move on with the block by block. But go ahead. Who, who was that? Um, this is me. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead, trust yeah. me. Um, just, just, and this is just for, for everyone. Um, I, I, I think that we definitely, uh, as you all agreed, as you just agree with uh, Trustee Steve, uh, we definitely need a housing committee. Um, and in regards to the program, I personally, um, I, I spoke, I have spoken with you regarding some of my changes and some of the things that I think. Um, in regards to the investor aspect of it, that was one of my main. Uh, concerns. Uh, I'll say it again. I think that with the investors, we need to obtain the money up front. So I, 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 with that portion, I don't think that uh, as a village, we should go into um, having them flip and then get reap our uh, portion after they uh, flip the property or after they um, sold the property. I think that we should get our money up front and we should be done with it. Um, and then with the housing committee, now that we're going to move forward with having a housing committee, I think that we won't spend as much time on a whole committee, on a committee of the whole discussing the, this, these type of things, because we are already have an idea because I hear you saying, hey, trustees, what is it that you want? What is it that you want? Uh, we need to move on this. So overall, um, I think that us moving forward with the housing committee will be the, the best step um, to assisting you with moving forward on your program. Um, and again, my, those changes in regards to the investor part was my main concern, but um, that's who I am in regards to the program. So I just believe in us having a housing committee so things could run smoothly. And I just believe in us making those changes in regards to what I felt in regards to the investor's portion. Um, that's it. Okay. Um, anybody else before I move on? This is Trustee Brown. You and I spoke as well. So mm -hmm. I told you what I disagreed with and what I agreed with. So mm -hmm. um, not true on my end. I did speak to you and, and let you know my thoughts mm -hmm. uh, on block by block. But I'm sure when you have the, um, the next meeting, I definitely will have something in writing as to where I want to see this program go. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Okay, moving forward. Next, we got discussion regarding the uses of 
the $1.5 million grant received from the American Rescue Act plan fund for COVID relief. Okay. Um, I knew that we received the money about two weeks ago. And my structure for um, the funds, and I asked everybody to give their input of what they feel we should do with the money. Just let me make sure everybody understand this, is it has to be COVID related. It can't be for anything but COVID related type of situations. So let me elaborate. I structure something so that we can give grants to the small business district and also give grants to the residents of Dalton. Um, what I need from the board of trustees is how do you guys want to go about it and how much money do you want to give each person? So we can do different things. We can do $2,500 um, per resident or $5,000 per resident, but understand it to be a limited cap on what we can do. So for the resident, my thing was we pay their water bills. And the reason why I stated that was because, of course, it comes full circle. It was a way for the village to make money as well. So they benefit by paying their bill, A, and then B, the money comes back into our general fund. So I just thought it was a, a, a great idea. So you guys let me know how you feel about that. And then the other way that I thought of using the money was to, of course, help the business district. So, of course, you guys know a lot of them was uh, shut down due to COVID, and you have to prove that you was – unemployed or your business was out of business in order to get the funds. That's one of the restrictions that's on the requirements. So I was thinking that we could have gave the business district $5,000. Um, and then you have to put a limited number on their cap. This is 1.5 million. We didn't get all of the funds yet. The other 1.5 comes next year around the same time. So they broke it up into spells. Excuse me. So my thing is, what would everyone like to do? And then something else too, at one of the means I had outdoors, um, the residents asked me to fix their concrete, which is not their sidewalks, but their driveways. I was asking them, what ways would you want us to spend the money? So they said that. They said a flooded basement. And my whole thing was to help the seniors, right? The seniors, due to the fact that they came for it um, to get windows or a roof. And that's the issue they normally have in the winter. So when the winter comes, it's always cold or I'm always taking heaters or making sure that people got um, things they need. So my thing to the board of trustees is what would you guys like to do with the funds? And what do you think about the suggestions that I make? So the floor is open. Any trustee? Can I be recognized, Mayor? Sure, go ahead, trustee. Um, so I just have a quick question because I, uh, I do think that some of the ideas of giving back would be great. Um, but you said, and when you first started off, you said, uh, it had to be COVID related. So, um, do we have something like in black and white that show what falls under COVID related yeah. items? We do. We do. I mean, that, that's why I'm asking. So if we, if we have like a guideline of what falls under it, then I would be more it's able in your to package. say what I think we should have. It's in okay. The, uh, it's right. right here. I'm looking at it now. It's right here. A memorandum from Jimmy Vasali, and it breaks down everything of how the money can be used. That's getting you know, all the information from. This is a state guideline right here. Okay, so mm -hmm. hold on, because I'll, I'll pull it up while I'm speaking to you. The only reason I'm saying that is because you went from concrete to giving out, um, giving out money to the residents to mm -hmm. paying the water bills. And I did, I'm almost sure I did read uh, some of these things. So when you say I was talking about the water bill, like wouldn't would that actually fall under the COVID? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you go to page one, it's on the first page on number four. It says right there. Make necessary investment in water, sewer, right here, infrastructure. It's right here on the page. Infrastructure, not a water bill. No, it, it do. Investments in water. You can. You can pay water bills. I already ran that through and, that. And time. that would be that and that would be okay for us to receive money and then we receive proceeds of the money. Correct. Okay. So they, I, I just want to. I bill. just want to be clear. That's why I'm asking because I want to be clear. No, that's fine. But that's why I'm making All a right. suggestion. So I'm asking, what are you guys for? What do you guys want to do? Like, what are you guys' opinion of it? Like, do anybody got any suggestions of how y'all want to use the money? Can, oh. can I make? Can I make, be recognized? Okay, hold on one sec. Let me go to Clark first and then I'll come back. <laughs> go ahead, Clark. So the presentation I made tonight regarding the electronic system for the foyer um, capturing is an item that can be funded under this act. So mm -hmm. I request that the cost of that uh, system be paid under this act. Okay. And I mentioned that in the presentation. 
Okay, so did you, the attorney say that it can? Because I, I don't know that. I haven't spoken to the attorney, but I will because. Okay, okay they got to research that. Okay, I just okay. want to make sure before we say okay. yes. Other than I'm fine, I'm I'm fine with it. Okay. They're fine with it, but yeah. Okay. And right. I'm um, sorry, the uh, presenter who was here tonight, he did um, offer a website that you can go on and see how it ties into this particular item. But, right. you know, I will pull it up and I'll send it to the attorneys. Okay, thank you. Trustee mm -hmm. Steve? Uh, go ahead. I know that that's a, that's a uh, touchy subject. That's hard to ask that question uh, at 10 o'clock at night when we've been on here since 6.30. Cause I know I'm not thinking clearly right now as far because I might think of something tomorrow. I might think of something the day after tomorrow. So we have to keep this conversation open uh, cause I can't really think of nothing like right now or what else I want to spend it on. So I don't want, I don't want it to be, um, if we don't, if I don't say nothing, we don't say nothing. He'd be like, well, we move forward. I asked the trustees, y'all want, what did y'all want? Y'all didn't say nothing, but it's late. It's been a long day. So if we can keep this open and I may, we may, I know I may come up with something tomorrow when I'm clear, a little well, a little well rested. Uh, and I can give my input then. But I can, okay. right now, it's 10 o'clock at night, I can't think of what else I want to spend it on. Okay, well, I'm fine with that, but you guys have had these packages since Thursday, so you had plenty of time to, like, write notes, think about what you want to do, so we had answers to all the questions. Um, but I'm fine with anybody that don't have a response to respond later or call me, and then we could go over it, but I would love to put something together for the residents um, sooner than later, so just uh, brainstorm. Anybody else? Mayor, if I can. Sure, trust the house. Um, two things. I, well, one one thing I think that um, getting documenting things that out or writing it out helps us to get a better picture of it uh, as, uh, as it relates to the funding, because uh, I think there are a lot of good ideas. My particular area of interest is, uh, I think you mentioned some infrastructure um, that can be done. I think there are several home, several areas that get significant flooding that have not been able to be attended to. So that will be my particular interest. Mm -hmm. But when we give the breakout of it, I think seeing it in writing will kind of help everybody and just knowing that the initial draft is a draft. So hopefully that whomever would come up with the draft would not be bothered that uh, there are going to be some adjustments to it. Uh, but I think all, a lot of things can be fit in there, but my particular interest is in the infrastructure and the uh, flooding and the sewerage, um, assuming that that does fit under the COVID relief. And then also want to make note that we did have in the present the presentation earlier, there was a noted a, a mention of using this funds to support that as well. So I think it's going to be really critical how much we're really looking at carving out. So I think getting it down there right and getting some rough ideas out there would help us to kind of uh, move forward. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Then that's it for that. If in trustees, please, um, if y'all could respond this week so I can have a plan for this. Okay, last but not least, I'm gonna be quick. I'm only gonna give a couple of the remarks because it is late. So um, as promised, I will be hosting my second virtual town hall meeting next Wednesday, September 29th. Oh, it is, it's at six, uh, trustee house. I could push the, the time up though. Um, it says 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. So I probably can just start a little later depending on your meeting. Um, that's for the record. So anybody that wants to attend, of course, it will be virtual. It'll be a link. Um, this Saturday, the Thorn Township Assessor Cassandra Holbert and Cook County Assessor uh, Figgy, uh, Fritz Kiggy uh, will be hosting a workshop specifically for the residents of Dalton about your property taxes. It will be this Saturday, September 25th, starting at 11 a.m. in the parking lot of Village Hall. So again, guys, if you have a problem with your taxes, and of course, Dalton uh, taxes did go up, and but no, it wasn't due to the board of trustees or myself. It went up uh, due to the fact of Keggy's office. So who better than a man himself who actually makes the decision to increase taxes or decrease taxes? He will be there. So you can't ask your question and they will be there also doing like certificates of errors or help you do freeze um, exemptions, um, things of that nature. So you might want to come bring your tax bill, uh, be prepared to sit there and, um, uh, get it filled out because they do it digital. That's the best way. So it will be packed. A lot of people are showing up because it is open to Thornton Township and the township being Riverdale, South Holland, Harvey. So anybody can come, but this is for adult residents, but I know you guys bring your friends that live next door. So that's fine. Um, 
Next month, we will be hosting a Halloween party for the children of Dalton on Sunday, October 31st. Uh, this party will also be in the Village uh, Hall parking lot. Uh, more information to come. Um, of course, I just feel that uh, with Halloween, the kids always get the short end of the stick because it's always cold or rainy. So we will be outdoors with this. We're putting together um, some fun in the sun for them, but hopefully it does not rain, but it will be outdoors. Um, I am announcing this early um, so you can get prepared. This year, we will be hosting a holiday decoration competition in December. Again, a, hol a holiday decoration competition will be in December. So start getting your decorations together so you can be included in this. More information will come. And again, guys, all the stuff that I announced do be on our Village of Dalton website. That is vodalton.org. Again, vodalton.org. Um, something else this Saturday from the police department, um, the mayor, myself, the board of trustees and Dalton police department is hosting its annual, uh, Dalton car show. The show will be held at Melody fitness, uh, parking lot from 4 PM to 7 PM. Um, this is a continuation of building, uh, the relationships of the community with the police department, similar to the foot patrols and the national night programs. So if you guys are available, please come out again. It's at Melly Fitness this Saturday from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Fire department. The roofs has been replaced on fire station two and soon the inside repairs will be done as well. Uh, public works. If you are aware of a broken sidewalk or in need of repair, please forward it directly to Superintendent um, Stacy Corral at S. Corral, which is C-A-R-R-E-L, at vodalton.org. Um, I have asked Stacey Carell to start to have the staff to rotate and stay until 7 p.m. on Mondays like they do with um, the water department. And no, the office itself won't be open, but the guys will still be out doing works and getting your needs addressed. Um, this will permit public works to answer complaints um, that come to us late and we don't have the time to get to them. Uh, once we meet with all the union uh, people, we will notify you guys of when this will start. So right now they're talking to the union because they are in the union as it relates to times. So I know they do stay over once it's like a bad snowstorm and things of that nature. So we're looking at um, doing the same thing. Uh, Water Department Payment Center is now open on Mondays until 7 p.m. So again, guys, if you're in need of paying your water bill and you get off late, Mondays are the only days that we're open to 7 p.m. Um, I am excited about the Village Hall parking lot, which will be paved or repaved, uh, should be starting this week or next week, next week, um, starting Monday. Um, it is an uh, anchor of the downtown area and it's important that we keep our property values up and make sure we lead by example by making sure our uh, house is in order. So I don't know if anybody have drove past Village Hall, but we have done a lot of remodeling as it relates to uh, putting mulch all around the Village Hall, putting flowers up, little, little spinny trees, all kinds of things. So um, also we will put lights throughout the town as well as it relates to uh, Christmas decorations and Thanksgiving. Uh, what else? We just spoke about the grants, uh, which was the $1.5 million. If a resident, you are watching this now, you want to give us your opinion of what we should do with the funds, please, by all means, chime in and tell us in the comments. But, but again, remember, it has to be used uh, due to COVID, like loss of job, loss of income, things of that nature. Um, I want to thank everybody that came out to the health and fitness house head workout. It was really nice over the weekend. We had an awesome, awesome crowd. I want to thank Sadiq for always showing up, showing out for the residents. Uh, they kept up. We did battle. Uh, we struggled a little bit. Um, my seniors like, Tiffany, we can't keep up. But it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. So I had to slow down because I'm a little hyper. Um, but we had a little dance off. Um, it turned to a little battle, which was kind of cool. And it was so family oriented. That's what I love about the things that I do put on for the village. I always try to keep family in mind and tell you bring your little ones. I know I had my baby Justice out there. She was even working out. So remember, they mimic what they see. So um, I'm trying to encourage people to get fit. If you're not fit, try to live a healthy life. And um, those little healthy workouts will continue. Uh, Back to school supplies was get, given away. Um, for those that didn't get anything, I do still have 
uh, backpacks available and also school uniforms. Yeah, I gave away uniforms. So I just don't know your colors. So if you go to like Dirksen, well, not Dirksen, that's not in my city, uh, Lincoln or uh, Burger Vandenberg, some of your uniforms are either tan or blue. So I have both colors still available. Um, and I'm not forgetting about my seniors. I'm announcing that I'm having a senior event coming up. We're going to have bingo with the seniors. Uh, stay tuned for a calendar from, from me um, to the residents. Um, the U programs, don't forget that we all agreed to basically um, hire youth for six weeks. And it will be every Saturday they will work. And the rate will be $11 an hour. Uh, we currently now have that posted on the Village of Dalton website. So if you're interested, you think you live in Dalton. Yes, you must live in Dalton. Uh, please apply. And we put it only on the weekends because we know you're in school so that you can come and do a couple hours of work. Um, now, that um, program is going to be structured where uh, you guys will cut lawns, which that's, that season's over. So basically now you will pick up leaves, like rake seniors leaves, and then also uh, shovel snow for them in the winter. That's how that program is structured to help the seniors out. Um, and then we should be having a customer service rep soon to answer phones. Uh, I think it was a resident apply. She stays in Dalton. I believe that um, Janice did bring her on. Okay, I think that's it for my announcements. I think I got it all out. But just don't forget this Saturday, I want to keep on, keep on stressing that. If you in need of help with your taxes, your property taxes, you want to be here at Village Hall in the parking lot at 11 a.m. That's when this will happen. 11 a.m. with um, your Cook County assessor, Fitz uh, Keggy. Again, Keggy will be there. He's the one that can actually make the changes that's needed for Dalton residents. So be there along with Cassandra Hober. I want to make sure I give her a shout out. Um, thank you again so much for tuning in. I know it was a long meeting, so I appreciate it. Uh, let's go to questions. Uh, Derek, we ready? All right. Um, In regards to the Melanie Fitness, has the village thought about making an emergency management building where departments can be in one place or a training center for fire departments in the South suburb? Going forward, does the board have any kind of comprehensive plan for improvements to our community? When will you cut the walkway when will you cut the walkway that starts at River, Riverside Drive to Town Country Park? It is a jungle, it's dangerous and it's a disgrace to the community. How long will the grant writer contract be? Was the Casper company approved by the board to handle a, a, a county matters or was that a mayoral decision? How much is the COVID testing from Agile? If the village employees or residents aren't vaccinated or don't want to get vaccinated, shouldn't it be their responsibility to get tested? Why should we have to pay for that? Another one about that. Why can't those requiring testing go to one of the free locations providing testing? Will the village inform the residents if any of the inspector staff test positive. I have several rental properties and my tenants and I are very concerned about inspectors entering our property. How much money did the village receive for COVID? How much of the COVID money has the village spent and how much is left? If the board decides to go with the company, um, I think this was in regards to the um, COVID testing, Will the village be open to the residents for board meetings? Is the village aware that South Suburban Hospital offers rapid COVID testing? Does the board still require RFPs for services? Who are going to pay for the family, for employees' families to be tested? Does Dalton have certified housing inspectors? Why increase the annual fee for landlords in order to give half of that revenue to a third party? 
Can the village of Dalton employees carry guns while on shift if they are not police officers? How much are the rental fees per unit? If a person's property is vacant, how will you know if they are not renting but still own the property? Why are the lights still off on Adams Street? They have been off for four weeks. Have the trustees obtained legislative counsel to serve them? How many foreclosed and abandoned properties are there in Dalton? What is the time frame from when monthly meetings are held versus the time a citizen's address are posted on the website? Were RFP, RFPs distributed for for your software and technology. On average, how many FOIA requests does the clerk receive each week? Can we ensure if the building is purchased as a class B that there, there'll be no liquor stores? Grass is not getting cut on 154th near countryside nursing homes. And that is it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, can we get a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn this evening's meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Second by Steve. Okay. Call the roll. Trustee Steve. Aye. Trustee Norwood. Aye. Trustee Belcher. Aye. Trustee Brown. Aye. And Trustee House. Aye. Motion to adjourn at 1024 p.m. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good, Good night. night.